What you're telling me is that music is about to stop, and we're going to be left holding the biggest bag of odorous excrement ever assembled in the history of Gap Desert. 1974, 1987, 92, 97, 2000, and whatever we want to call this. It's all just the same thing over and over. We can't help ourselves. I say when we sell. Hey, 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 I say when we sell. All right, and we're live. Really excited for this episode, gentlemen. We're joined by Max Webster from Hive Mind Ventures. And uh, really excited for this episode because it's going to be a bit of a, a different conversation to date. This is episode 15. We've had a lot of institutional investors, allocators, um, other venture fund uh, types on the show, but we've really been focusing in on Bitcoin, the asset and how it will fit into your portfolio, how it should fit into your portfolio with the digital gold thesis. And we've hinted at it, uh, in many episodes since we launched in May. But, uh, I, I think everybody on this call truly believes that that is just the surface layer of what Bitcoin has to offer the world. And again, we brought Max on this week because he's on the cutting edge of where, Bitcoin is really becoming a medium of exchange in the digital age. It's becoming the payments layer of the internet. Um, and so with that monologue, Max, I'll throw it to you to introduce yourself. Tell us how you got to where you are today and, and what you're doing at Hivemind Ventures. Yeah, I mean, uh, very high level. I first read about Bitcoin in 2011 when I was a student at university and you know, grew up, I would say, with a more non-traditional sort of out there uh, parents who question a lot of things and as did I. So I thought it was a really cool idea, but um, yeah, frankly, I thought I had very little chance of working. So I, I didn't buy any, uh, which I had and kind of forgot about it for many years. My other big obsession was with energy. And I think that's maybe one of the sort of unique perspectives I brought to this space. Um, I also really just enjoy like finding exponential curves or finding, you know, where the cost of something is falling very rapidly. And so as I was graduating from university around 2011, 2012, I became pretty obsessed with the cost of solar falling off of a cliff. And for every doubling of cumulative capacity deployed, as all the levelized cost of energy was coming down, I thought like 20%. Turns out it was more like 40%. And so I got really excited about that. Um, we jumped in the energy industry, uh, you know, did a couple of things, startups that totally bombed, then moved down to Mexico in early 2015 as the first hire at a startup called Bright. Um, which was YC's first investment in solar in Mexico. I was down there for almost five years. Um, we're now you know, the largest residential solar company in Mexico. And while I was down in Mexico, I got two kind of eureka moments that got me, re, uh, I guess, acquainted with Bitcoin. The first was I started seeing Bitcoin as energy-backed money, and this was my big thesis. And I was very interested in crypto. I started reading in 2016 about some of these Ethereum projects for like decentralized energy trading, thought that was cool. Eventually it hit me though that Bitcoin is essentially like a ledger of energy. And I think this is one of the things I, I take slightly different than, than most people. Um, my hero is Buckminster Fuller. Um, he called for energy backed money. Tesla did, Ford did, all these people. And so when I started seeing, you know, thinking about that the universe of the energy, uh, the, the currency of the energy is calories and wherever you choose to demarcate it. Bitcoin is the purest form we've ever had on that. That started to help me separate the signal from the noise and realize I think it's going to be Bitcoin. I also around that time in 2017 read the lightning white paper. And, you know, watch Lalo and some of these guys talk about what could happen scaling that. And, you know, I had some familiarity with how the internet scaled, the OSI model. And so I started thinking, I think that a lot of these other crypto projects are piloting interesting ideas. Um, but maybe this is kind of like a little bit like the web van moment, like this is not the right rails to do it on, or it's, um, you know, a little too early adoption wise. It's probably going to happen at higher level of, abs of abstraction on Bitcoin. Um, but at that time, I was certainly not smart enough to be participating in Lightning Network development. It was super hard to run a node. And so I just kind of kept in the back of my head. Meanwhile, while I was living in Mexico, I saw that, you know, a bunch of my friends, you know, their parents were literally just like storing in USD under the mattress because they didn't have access to, you know, um, you know bank accounts in the United States. And half of the country was unbanked. I had friends from Argentina and Venezuela going through hyperinflation. And so for them, it was a lot easier to explain Bitcoin. And that kind of helped me realize that, you know, in emerging markets, this was going to be probably more of a, um, a fit earlier on. So that all got me really excited about Bitcoin, did some work with Bitso and the big exchange in Mexico around payments with Bitcoin in 2018, quickly realized it could never scale on layer one, kind of became re- um, I guess, committed to the Lightning Network is like, this is our best chance of scaling and making Bitcoin actually useful. 
And so uh, around that time, I moved back to San Francisco. I worked at a different venture fund, Version One Ventures, um, for about a year and a half. There I did all of our sort of climate energy stuff, as well as all of our crypto projects. And I tried to go in with a pretty open mind. We invested in all of the big Ethereum projects, um, Uniswap, Open, Nexus, all this stuff. And, and I really did try and you know say, well, maybe there's a chance some of these other networks will be interesting for other kinds of computation. Basically became very uh, <laughs> jaded with that when I would ask all the other entrepreneurs, you know, all of them, I'd say, I asked one question, like, do you run a full node for your ecosystem? You know, was basically told by uh, all of them that there were exactly zero full nodes being run other than um, by Infura or um, Alchemy. And so that's when I started realizing, I started, kind of started feeling like Michael Burry and the Big Short, and I was like, I don't think any of this is real. So I knew I had to come back to Bitcoin, and I knew that what was interesting to me was Bitcoin becoming interesting as the currency of the internet and the currency of the world. And so in about two years ago, I started Hive Mind Ventures. Um, and the thesis was essentially that the Lightning Network is what's going to make Bitcoin useful. And so Fund One was very focused on Lightning Network infrastructure. We invested in uh, a number of companies, um, almost 40, almost exclusively Lightning Network companies, Lightning Labs, River, LightSpark, um, a whole bunch of early ones, uh, open source projects like Ellen Bits, um, a whole bunch of and, and that haven't been announced yet. And then over time, I started realizing that it wasn't just going to be infrastructure, but as we move into the Lightning Network application phase, that the things that were most interesting for Lightning Network, in addition to cross-border payments, which is, I think, pretty um, pretty clear, was going to be uh, around Nostr and around AIs using Lightning for payments. And those are two like really radically new areas where Lightning Network applications can thrive. And so today, I kind of think as I move into my sort of next fund is we're moving into the Lightning Network or Bitcoin application phase. And I think that um, my sort of protocol stack that I'm investing on is uh, Bitcoin as the decentralized monetary network, Lightning as the decentralized payments network, and Nostr as the decentralized data network. And those three things together will be able to build all the ideas that you saw in crypto and many, many more. And the decentralized AI stuff is going to be a big part of that. And I'm sure we'll talk a lot about that today as well. Yeah, one uh, one thing to add, and I, I may uh, embarrass Max a little here, but Max, when we met um, a little over two years ago, that was what really stuck out when well, you were coming out of the transition from the crypto and web and Uni Uniswap. And I had an ex I don't think I have met somebody that has gone through that kind of um, like, I don't know if it's trial by fire because we've all been there. We have stories about first going to crypto, but also like really investing and being like, full in it and taking that step back and being honest with themselves like wait maybe this isn't the right thing and then also having that lens and we we're chatting before the the pod with um your i don't know what you call him if it's a co-host or if it if it's official with the david king but similarly coming from the silicon valley background um it's not a it's a, it's not always a given but it's a nice heuristic in my mind when you see folks coming from the quote unquote legacy world, because there's like institutional, like tribal baked in uh, standards built into whether it's TradFi or the Googles of the world. And then they come in and find their way into Bitcoin that it always was like, okay, this guy's on to something. So it's been awesome to see the past two years and navigating that and then going to the very edges, which I think of like Nostra at the very edge of like all of this. But I think everybody that's looked at it would agree there's a lot happening there that ties into Bitcoin. So it's awesome yeah. to have you on the show. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And yeah, I'm a big fan of all of you guys. So excited to be here. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm curious. I actually just want to jump in there of like, what was it like? Like, what was that, that journey for you like when you realized that Uniswap wasn't the thing? Like, was there, was it, you just kind of woke up one day and it was clear or were there a couple touch points or like, what was your experience like there? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think I, you know, I should be clear on this in that prior to quote unquote investing professionally <laughs> in those ecosystems, you know, I was already on the path to becoming a Bitcoin. Like I mentioned, you know, I, I read about Bitcoin in 2011 and did some pretty serious investigations in 2016 and 2017. And I wasn't 100% sold, right? Like I still thought other projects, like at the time, Monero was pretty interesting and some other things. Um, and so I, I really did try and keep an open mind. And so I thought, you know, there are a lot of really smart people and funds, frankly, that are investing in these other ecosystems, you know, maybe I'm really missing something. And so I went in, I would say, with more of a Bitcoin lens to begin with, but open-minded enough to say, what am I missing? And to be frank, I mean, <laughs> you know, just asking all those questions, literally finding that no one's running nodes, it's getting more difficult to run nodes. Like, I think the way I describe to people is like very simply, like, I guess one of the middle models of crystallized for me is if you think about, you know, two curves, right? And there's the rate of 
um, like the size of your blockchain growing, right? That has a certain steepness. And then there's the cost of consumer hardware to run a full node. And that's the bandwidth, the storage, all that. That has a certain steepness. And if this one is steeper than this one, i.e. if your blockchain is growing way faster than it's getting cheaper and easier to run a node, then it has to centralize. It's just a question of when. And so I kept like formalizing that thought process over my year and a half, like trying to like see where I was wrong and no one could tell me I was wrong. I looked into all the DeFi stuff. I tried to understand, well, where's the actual yield coming from? I just couldn't identify it. Um, and you know, I, I really thought, well, maybe I'm missing something. And then after a while, you know, it, I, I will say this, it definitely gave me a, cer a certain degree of confidence where like, you know, I'm seeing, and not to say I don't respect these guys. These are all fantastic funds that are incredible in many ways, but you know, you're looking at these funds you used to ide idealize like A16Z or even Sequoia, like investing in FTX and stuff. And you start thinking, well, wait a second, you know, maybe, um, maybe a lot of people aren't thinking from first principles truly. Mm -hmm. and if you do that, then there's huge alpha and, you know, Fuck it. I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to do it on my own and see what happens. So, yeah, it's, it's so interesting how there's this, this misconception of, of, among altcoiners and, and the broader crypto world that Bitcoin maximalists haven't looked into altcoins enough. Like th that's the assumption on that side of things is, oh, they, they'll, they'll get to altcoins because, um, you know, there's so much excitement here and they just don't know about it. They're still on version one with, uh, uh, boring Bitcoin, and, and then you are are proof positive that it's actually the 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 other way. There's a there's a hero's journey of you start with Bitcoin, you go into the wilderness, and you end up coming back. Yeah, totally. I mean, oops, sorry, go for it. Mike. <clears throat> no, I was gonna say I, th I think this conversation, like this, what we're talking about right now, re really reminds me of my favorite blog post of all time about Bitcoin, which is Gwern's 2012 post. Uh, Bitcoin is worse is better. And I think to give the audience like a better understanding about what Gwert meant by that, um, I think you began to touch on it with how uh, these systems, if they're going to be successful, need to be sufficiently distributed at the end of the day. Like what in your mind gives you confidence that Bitcoin at the base layer has that sufficient distribution, whether it be full nodes, hash rate, uh, private key ownership? It's full nodes and yeah, but full nodes and hash rate. I think, um, you know, again, my the and, and again, I'm, I'm not saying there aren't other things that shouldn't have different degrees of centralization or decentralization. Right? Like, I'm, we'll talk a lot about this, but that's why I'm so excited about Nostra. I do think there are interesting things. Like, I do think the idea of a quote unquote DEX, a decentralized marketplace, is absolutely fascinating. I just don't think that needs to be on a blockchain. Um, I think it can be done, you know, perfectly well with Nostra. I think decentralized social media is amazing. Again, doesn't need a blockchain. So I, I really like a lot of those ideas and was very much looking for something like Nostra that would say the only thing that really, really needs, because if you think about it, like to have, you know, sufficient decentralization of the base layer, I, I think if I had to choose one thing, it's, it's the nodes and then the hash rate. And so to run a whole bunch of nodes, I mean, it, it's very expensive to be able to audit that whole system and have some form of global state. And so I think something, you know, like the base uh, economic unit, the money is probably the only thing you really need that for. If you're just doing communication, you need some way to, you know, sign a private message, have enough different nodes out there or enough different servers or relays saying, yes, this data exists. Yes, it was signed with the right private key, but you don't need everyone to agree on the exact same global state for that. And so anyway, so that was kind of always in the back of my head, but with Bitcoin at that base layer, you do need um, radical decentralization. And uh, I think, you know, you guys are way deeper than, in this than I am, but you know, the, the history of money and is, is pretty clear that it always gets debased and, you know, you need to fight the fight to keep that one layer decentralized truly. And I think a uh, number of nodes, making sure that, you know, I remember the 2017 block wars, making sure it's super easy for anyone that wants to run a node to be able to run a node, whether they're in, you know, Ecuador or the United States, it needs to be cheap enough, easy enough. That's super important. And then the amount of hash going up, like whenever people are concerned about Bitcoin, I'm like, look, if, if my thesis is right, and this is just energy backed money, um, then, you know, as long as hash rate continues to go up over time, I'm not concerned. It's funny you bring that up because uh, those two, I think nobody would dispute, but the one that I think is like directly one-to-one -one is private keys and nodes. Because I think if you have infinite number of nodes and the private key sit between Coinbase and, and name the other one, it doesn't really matter the number of nodes because the private keys in a similar, I think uh, those are the, that's the one that doesn't get talked about a lot. And I'm curious, do you have any thoughts on like private key ownership? You know, I haven't thought to distribution, do distribution, really, right? Like outside of a core uh, contingent of, you know, institutions holding a large subset of the private keys. 
Well, well I, I definitely think more people holding private keys is definitely a better thing. I, I, what would the argument be? I haven't really thought about this one too much. Why would that be as important as nodes auditing the, um, the ledger itself? So in my mind that if you have, let's say 10 nodes auditing the network and 10 separate large entities holding the keys, mm -hmm. you want it to grow in proportion because if you have an infinite number of nodes, so we get the decentralization there and decentralization of hash, mm -hmm. but you end up with, let's call it five entities holding the majority of the keys. So mm -hmm. I think about it similar, like what you mentioned, digital gold, in my mind, like kind of started to go to this anchor point of like one of the big, and it's almost cute to say it's not the only thing, but the big difference between Bitcoin and gold is multi-sig because you're able to not have this centralization of the asset. Because if we break down like from a first principles level of where gold failed, it's centralized with banks. Mm -hmm. And they were able to start mucking with the supply of the, the claims on the gold. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I like anchor to this like keys and it's stuff we work on at OnRamp. So I'm obviously like talking my book, but it's also like an important thing. I don't think a, a lot of folks talk about is like the key ownership and the uh, it's, it, it's about getting as many out in the network, almost to the edges, similar to nodes in the sense that you want to, um, like, especially from like, I don't know if they're, they're the most appropriate is tyranny, but like you want it, you want to have that uh, cost of violence as far and distributed to go and take possession of the asset. And if it was centralized within five, 10, even a hundred identifiable institutions, or entities, it gets a lot easier to basically co-opt um, the asset, independent of how many nodes are out there. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that's a very fair point. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, in general, more people holding more keys also is good for less volatility, which has happened over time. I think that's going to keep happening as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I would certainly say that's another important point. Yeah, I mean, luckily the data here is in our favor too. Hash rates going up, full node owners are going up and then Bitcoin held off exchanges is going up as well. There's been a complete exodus, not a complete exodus, but a material exodus off of exchanges the last two years. That's sort of the beauty. Bitcoin has this anti-fragile system. Um, I mean, the anti-fragility works at the protocol layer, but then the social layer, people see an FTX, a Celsius, a BlockFi blow up and they go, oh, wow, like maybe my Bitcoin isn't safe on this exchange. I should get it into keys that I that I actually possess. So, I mean, the old sure. adage that everything's good for Bitcoin, even if it's an exchange blow up, seems to be playing out in no, real like, time. And one thing I would add on here, just sort of my, my realist point of view on this, I think it's amazing and I tell everyone, like owning your own keys is an incredible, uh, you know, step in the journey for a lot of people. But, but I do think that there will always be, you know, various forms of centralized institutions, right? Like there could be multi-sig, there could also just be like, you know, single, um, you know, uh, custodians. And I think that on a Bitcoin standard, if, if they do start to hold that ideally with a lot more transparency and they go under, well, then they go under it and people learn over time, which ones are much more trustworthy, which ones are not. I, I do think it's important for everyone to kind of evaluate and where they are in their journey. Like, cause if you do hold your own private keys, right? Like a lot of people I know have just lost those too. I think that that's a really real risk. Um, but I think for me, the most important thing is that it should be very easy to move between yourself, any custodian, it should be very easy for everyone to be transparent with what they hold, what they don't hold. Um, and then, you know, from there, I guess, you know, over time, it probably becomes easier for more people to hold their own. But um, I, I think interoperability and transparency are probably the things that I, I most uh, value there. Yeah, auditability is important from like the market, just going back to reputation based. Um, something you mentioned about uh, the crypto, it's like, I think there's a high form of alpha, it's just like looking at crypto firms that like had quote unquote traction. And then, oh, yeah. and then you just like literally put a, you just insert sats into it. Like the one that always comes to mind is the step, the step in thing. Remember like step in, in 2021, it was the thing you got like tokens and it turned into like people just trading it, but it was like to incentivize going and working out. It's so, like, that's kind of interesting. Like if you can like gamify that, but you don't need an altcoin. Um, but yeah, there's yeah. so many opportunities. That, that was the one that they, they, they sold shoes that had like, like, uh, what do you call them? Uh, uh, accelerometers in them, right? To count how many steps you were taking. And then you were paid tokens based on how many steps you were taking every day, which is such a bizarre distribution mechanism, but it got a lot of hype. 
Totally. I actually joke with people. I mean, like you say that kind of tongue in cheek and as do I, but also just like truthfully, I love to like go like look at the multi-coin portfolio, see what gets traction, just be like, okay, imagine this, but done without a shit coin, right? Like just imagine this done with money. And I think, for example, this is why I was so excited to see Nostra. I do think, you know, we want decentralized messaging to be able to build those marketplaces. But again, there's no reason you need a blockchain for that. So three of the things I'm most bullish on, and in fact, I just invest in one of these and, you know, continually hunting for their ones are decentralized markets for bandwidth, storage and compute. Those are all great ideas. Don't need their own token. And um, for many reasons, like, you know, having your own token, obviously there, there's many reasons why it's a bad idea, but one is just, you don't have liquidity. If I get paid with helium, what the hell am I supposed to do with this helium token? If I get paid with sats, well, over time, there's more and more exchanges I can get that into whatever my local currency is, or, you know, increasingly just trade that for goods and services. But like, yeah, I'm super bullish on a lot of those quote unquote crypto ideas. And that's why I said, it's kind of like, I saw 2017 and, you know, the, the years after that, it's kind of like the web van moment. Like online grocery delivery, really good idea. Infrastructure wasn't there yet. And this is maybe a little bit scammier and more, uh, you know, dangerous than that. But yeah. So Max, let's like, let's slow that one down and play it out a little bit of like, okay, so why don't you need Filecoin? You know, like, so, or whatever the other set of um, storage on your computer being used and and um, by decentralized like aws a decentralized aws um, instance basically and you get paid for l lending for renting out your storage space that's mm -hmm. basically the model right and, right and then so then they've created these these tokens like filecoin and others that are just the variants of the same idea um to be the currency that you're paid out in um, so why don't you need that to be baked into the system? And then how do sats replace that? Well, so I think there's two different ways you can look at this. One is you can just like have a very sort of like simple business model. And like, I'm sure you guys have heard value for value, um, which to me is really funny because it's, it's like, it's like such an obvious idea. It's like, wait a second. You mean like I do something valuable and you pay me something valuable. Like it, it's almost like so obscenely simple of like, of course, that's what the economy should be, right? And so if you if you take this idea that Bitcoin is the best money, it's energy backed money, and you're producing some kind of valuable work, well, that has some caloric value, and um, and, and you're gonna pay me in that. Now, there, there's two models I can see working with this. Model number one is I just pay you for the service you provide. And in that world, the reason Bitcoin is so much better and it gets, keeps getting better with every month over time is frankly liquidity, right? I can pay you out in sats and now, and I know for a fact, because I've invested in many of these companies, companies like you know, Neutron Pay, Pouch, Ibex, uh, Bitnob, all these different companies that are kind of like lightning to fiat rails around the world. You can cash that out to your local currency or cash that out for goods and services, right? If I pay you in Helium token, what the hell are you supposed to do with the Helium token? Where can you trade that? Like, where can you get, you know, goods and services of that? And again, I'm not saying we're perfect there with Bitcoin yet. I actually think something like Taro probably offering US dollars on top of it is going to help this a lot in the short run. But as a monetary network, Bitcoin and Lightning continues to grow and gain more and more interoperability. Another way of saying that is Bitcoin and Lightning to me are the internet of value. All these other, you know, quote unquote, cryptocurrencies are intranets. They're not interoperable. And so I'm always going to bet all day, every day on the network that's open, interoperable, and keeps growing, right? And uh, and that's Bitcoin and Lightning in my mind. So that's the first reason. The one thing that I will say that I'm open to where this is going to go is I do think, you know, what Helium and some of these other th things tried to do was essentially give people equity, right? So not just pay you in cash, which I think cash can work just fine. But, you know, say, hey, if you uh, have earlier ownership in this network, perhaps it's more valuable. And I am interested in see how people are going to do, and maybe this will come with Taro or something, but the ability to... Um, basically give you like sats flows over time. I think, you know, if you think about what equity is, it's just a, a, a claim on future cash flows. And so if there's some way that you can get a, a, a bigger claim by being earlier on future um, sats flows, Bitcoin flowing through the network, I think that's pretty interesting. And so I'm, I'm curious how people are going to experiment with that. Yeah. Yeah. One thing um, you, you said the value for value. And I think, uh, when we go through that, I think it's probably helpful to explain why there's a problem and you could probably do it better than, than anybody, but it's just like breaking down from first principles, like how fundamentally the internet wasn't, it, it's, it's relatively new. It's 20, you know, consumer internet, let's call it two thousands, maybe even 95. So you have 20 to 30, 25 to 30 years. But then we look at like the status of Facebook, Twitter, and, and the way things were, were made and people assume like, this is what will always be. Um, if you can help break down like where things fell apart there because I think that actually helps. And then as we start thinking about value for value, Noster and some of the stuff that uh, is, is being created, because I think of it similarly with like venture and 
just like capital formation in today's world, it's like the value for value um, isn't actually going to the most valuable. It's There's this like latency in the signal because of all the muckiness. And that's similar to like what we see in the internet today. Um, do you want to break down, break that down and then we can riff post that? I don't want to hijack Marty's, uh, Marty's <laughs> plot, but uh, you, you signal the value for value and there's a lot there. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I think one way of looking again, value for value, right? It's just like, to me, it's just, it's, it's a, it's an exchange of like you, it's proof of work. You do work and I give you this digital proof of work, i.e. energy, potential energy for your, you know, um, actual energy or your active energy, kinetic energy. And so I think that the way I think about Bitcoin and lightning is um, it's, you know, it's a currency for the internet. And when the internet was formed, there, you know, are these various HTTP error codes. Most people have seen like 404 error as an example, page not found. But if you go to um, 402, right, that was the error for payment not received. So it's not like these are new ideas. People were really curious and planning for currency of the internet. It just wasn't a solved technological problem of how to do it yet. And I, you know, the reason my fund, for example, is called Hive Mind is I, I think humanity is at this just really exciting evolutionary point. We're about to enter the next stage of human evolution. And that next stage is, um, you know, if you think about how like how evolution flows or, or how um, I don't know, everything in the universe flows, there's this idea of like whole lines, right? Like things are parts and then they're holes. So holes become parts of new holes all the way up and all the way down. This is true from, you know, uh, molecule or cells and molecules and organs, and organ systems and bodies and ecosystems, the planet all the way up and all the way down. And so what I think we're about to do, we're living through this crazy time where, you know, historically we've had nation states which i think in like you know a couple hundred years are going to look kind of like a little silly i'm not saying they're going to totally die i think it's it's kind of probably like the catholic church used to have a lot more power of the world it's still around but much less so it's probably what's going to happen with nation states but yeah i think our kids kids are going to be like it's kind of weird like why is it that you know just because i was born on like the wrong side you were born in mexico and i was born in brownsville texas we couldn't do like you know projects together and exchange value together like that that's just like just seems really weird when you think about that from future generations perspectives and so i think that you know we started by laying the best version of the internet that we could um and when i say laying that I actually mean like the physical infrastructure the cables and then obviously all the services that came on top of that without having a native currency for the internet and kind of trying to like make this like kind of frankenstein system work with all of our legacy um fiat currencies and payment networks that were just never meant for the um, for the internet, right? Like, I mean, if you have, you know, an ACH transfer that takes you five days to clear or a wire that takes a couple of days and $15, like, you, like everything else in the internet allows information to spread, to spread at the speed of light. And so money just can't match that right now. And so you have this just, just bizarre mismatch of information wanting to be free and being free, but not being able to develop business models around that because the monetary and payment networks don't work with it. Right. And so what I think is going to happen next is we've kind of laid this first version of all of the neurons that are connecting humanity into a hive mind. And I think we're actually at a bit of a turning point. Um, one model of the hive mind is more, I guess, of like a Chinese type model where it's very top down, state controlled. Um, and, and that's pretty, pretty scary in my mind. Another version of the hive mind is a very decentralized sort of markets driven hive mind where it's, um, it's self-emergence, it's self-forming. And, and that's what I think Bitcoin represents. That's what I think Lightning represents. That's what I think Nostra represents. And so I think the next big phase is, you know, Bitcoin as a currency on the internet is great. And I think we're going to see a lot of really cool business models emerge with just using, you know, Lightning payments. Um, for example, companies like Stacker News, which I'm an investor in, there's a lot of cool stuff happening with those kinds of sites. But then I think the, even the phase beyond that is we start thinking, well, if we now have this new currency and payments network on the internet, why don't we build an internet itself that's more in that shape or form? And that's what I think Nostra is. We can talk about the architecture of that, but a more decentralized version of the internet. And then I think the far version even beyond Nostra is an idea that Drew Bansel's talked a lot about, which is that eventually we're going to use these new primitives to actually go da- back and probably relay new physical infrastructure itself that's more uh, in line with a decentralized internet and a decentralized payment system. And so like actually having packets themselves need to have payments associated with them. I think that's going to come in the far future, but I think that that's the direction that we're, we're moving in. We're going to have one sort of like, um, you know, energy exchange system, or as he calls it metabolic system. And that's what the new organism is composed of all of us as individual organisms within it. Yeah. We're getting cosmic here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, no, I, 
I completely agree with everything you just said because I've seen it play out in real time. Um, like podcasting 2.0, perfect example. RSS sends out our podcast. We can put a lightning network address in there. People can stream a sats, boost a sats as they listen. Obviously, Noster uh, notes and other stuff transferred over relays. That's what Noster stands for. For anybody who's wondering what we're talking about, I think we'll dive deeper into Noster, but I think to really set the tone for the rest of the conversation, let's, let's, let's like build it up where particularly around the lightning network. So we're five and a half years after the lightning network launched in March of 2018. Uh, it launched to much fanfare. Uh, however, there are many out there who think for some reason or another that lightning has not been successful. So I think Max, I'm curious, um, just starting at lightning five years in, like, where is it? And why do people have these misconceptions? And then obviously we've mentioned Noster and podcasting 2.0, and you mentioned AI earlier. Um, yeah. Where is it now? And then how? what are you seeing in terms of it being integrated into these other open protocols? Yeah. So I think the first thing I would say to that is like, obviously, you know, I would love to see this go even faster. Like who, who wouldn't? Like I, I wish everyone was using Lightning Wallet, and I can't say that, you know, we're, we're anywhere near that. Yet. We, we have a ways to go. If you think about, you know, I don't know what the, the most recent numbers are, but I've seen estimates somewhere in the order of like two, 300 million people-ish that have interacted with Bitcoin in some way. I'm assuming that includes Coinbase. Maybe you guys have better data on that. But let's call it in that like low hundreds of millions. Um, that's, you know, around 97 internet level penetration. And so I think kind of my big bet is that from 97 to 2007 is when you saw, you know, Google and Facebook and Twitter, I guess Twitter came around a little later than that. But like, th that's when you saw a huge wave of all of these big successful internet companies first form Amazon. And I think we're about, I think we're living through that right now, literally as we speak. And so as I think about my fund as an investor, right, like, you know, one of the tricky things is timing. Like I'm pretty confident in where all of this direction is going to head. Trying to time the wave um, it is tricky and making sure that companies are well enough capitalized to be able to ride it. But I think that, you know, my last two years was very heavily focused on infrastructure, right? Um, and we've come such a long way. I don't think people realize now, like if anyone wants to understand how easy Lightning is to use, I would say download Cash App, buy Bitcoin, go to El Salvador and like pay for a lot of things instantly for free from Cash App. That's a wild statement. A U.S. publicly traded company's payment app is my wallet in El Salvador right now, not theoretical, right? So that's, that's one crazy example. An even better example, because I think that some of the nation state adoption stuff is cool, but honestly happened faster in some ways than I, than I thought it would, is using it again as the currency of the internet. And so I would say the two most interesting projects for anyone to get an idea of what's happening here are Albi, getalbi.com. Uh, and on Albi, you can basically download a Chrome extension, which is your Lightning wallet, and use that for all kinds of experiences on the internet. One would be stacker.news, which is like Reddit, but you upvote with Bitcoin. And there's a lot of interesting implications around surfacing value and information and all kinds of other things. But again, that just works, right? Like, there, like you, it, there's no questions around theory. I load up $20 worth of sats, got a couple hundred, hundred thousand sats, and I go and zap articles instantly. I see it leave my wallet and go to someone else's wallet instantly, real time for free. That's a real experience. So I think the last two to three years were kind of about laying the initial infrastructure. Another way that I sometimes think about this is like, we're kind of like, I think the Lightning Network, I don't think people have seen it like this, but it's kind of like we're, we're laying the next railroad track. And I true, truly believe, you know, the like the Vanderbilts and Morgans and like really big uh, industrialists are going to be those that can kind of take advantage of, frankly, and capitalize on laying the track correctly, owning, you know, the... Um, some of the grand centrals that are sitting there routing. And I think those companies, probably a lot of them already exist. I think companies like River, Neutron Pay, Pouch, Block, um, Ibex, uh, you know, Bitnob, and a lot of them are going to be in different sort of zones. Like that infrastructure is pretty developed right now. So then I think the next thing we're missing is the actual application phase. Stacker News is one incredible example, but you know, that that was a little bit ahead of its time. That's because Keenan's not only an application developer, but a protocol developer as well. But now you're starting to see the libraries, for example, Albi's libraries, Breeze's libraries are getting good enough that a JavaScript level developer can come in and start to build applications with Lightning. And that's when things start to get really interesting. Because once the developers can build new experiences, that's going to bring on you know way more users because they can go out and build specific apps for their users. And I do think the two areas, the three areas I'm most bullish on are international payments. That's already happening. That's a bit of a slog, but it's going to keep happening. Companies like Strike, uh, all the companies I mentioned are focused there. But the two areas that I'm most excited about are 
you know, when you look at investment waves, what is brand new, not trying to like tag on the old activity with a new substrate, but literally build up a new activity in a new substrate. And so I think Nostra based applications where you natively zap any piece of content or can natively conduct payments um, in, in any kind of Nostra app, and I'll, I'll talk about what that means next or whatever you want, that's going to be huge. And then the AI is paying each other, which I know sounds very sci-fi and crazy, um, but you know the TLDR there is like, you're about to live in a world with, you know, if we have billions of humans, I think trillions of artificial intelligences and uh, JP Morgan is not banking them, right? Like it's just not going to happen. And so the ability for AIs to be able to interact with each other and other internet services at the speed of light, like information can happen, that just can't happen with the old payment rails. So that's why I'm so focused on, um, on Nostra and AI use cases right now, because I think that's where we're going to see the brand new novel concepts that take the infrastructure from lightning that's already built and just like bring it into the mainstream. Yeah, this is something yeah. Marty, you know, this is something Marty and I talk about a lot. It's like we try to pontificate or I right, figure out is it the asset that goes up or the u- utility? And it feels like it's, and this is what's exciting about what we're talking about. It happens in levels at the same time where you're referencing and there's stuff like Vita and, and others that are building like this native app that can be used in real, in real mm-hmm. applications. The example that I always, anchor to um, just because they're annoying. I think for everybody's like robo calls from spam. And if you can set up a way that they can ping a server to figure out if it is spam or not, and you have it a fractional uh, amount of sats that are paid, and it just becomes a better experience for somebody to download that, figure out how to top up the wallet. And you, you, you know, you mentioned AI and these other utilities uh, or other projects that can be used. And, it, and at the same time that you're downloading this application, you're referencing sats or you're seeing this like token and the price is appreciating and they're happening in parallel and they kind of just like meet in the middle. Uh, as least, at least that's how I've started to think about it the past 12 months as seeing all this like crazy things that can just be built uh, inherently better because now you have a token that's native to the internet versus having this like clunky version of buying credits or figuring out how it can programmatically interact with um uh, an application that's that's newer or form fit for like where we're at today. A hundred percent agree. And maybe it would be helpful uh, if you guys are okay with this. Maybe we can do a deep dive on Noster and why Lightning will thrive there and then AI. Can, can, yeah. before, before we do that, um, one of the things that I, I wanted to reference or just like tie it back because I think we're so far down the rabbit hole that it makes sense to oh, us, no. but it's, that it's like um, – it's anchoring back to like where, why there's a problem. Like you reference yield in the same way that we talk about like yields a problem in the sense of uh, there's the joke. We'll probably give it to Phil Geiger. It's like, if you, if you don't know where the yield's coming from, it's coming from you, you are the yield. Yeah. We all, we, we know in the same way, like if you're getting the service, mm-hmm. it's your attention is the yield. Like you are giving it, you're providing it. And when the internet came about, when you think about Google AdWords and Facebook, all of that infrastructure costs. And so that's where the internet was built based on ads. And you see all this like crazy, just like, it's just like, oh, I just keep anchoring this word like tumor. It just like looks nasty because it doesn't make sense. And you don't know how it came about, but somebody's subsidizing that and you are via your attention in these other formats. And so, um, and we can go down the other use cases, but I think that's an important aspect because I was listening um, to one of the pods you did with David and I knew there was a lot here inherently just cause he knew the internet was messed up, but then one about Google and the highlighter. And it really like hit me that Google's whole job is to crawl and surface quote unquote valuable information on the web, but right. it isn't because of that inherent latent, like between the, the, the value and then the value that's on the internet. So you get shit at the top. And that's via like blogs and pot and like all the stuff that's there. It's what people have paid or what's gone versus what do people find the most interesting or the most valuable. And the second you can highlight or input some proof of work tied to what somebody really is willing to give away, to your point on the high mind, you start to surface the best information and it re-architects what's actually happening in people. And that can go across all mediums. It doesn't have to be a blog post. It can be a how-to. It can be music. Um, and so anyway, I just think of it, it's like an interesting aspect to like break down, like where, how information isn't actually coming in the right direction. Value isn't going there. And so that inherently has to be fixed if we want it to be the most efficient. And then that's where Nostra and these things like come about, or at least that's our, I believe our thesis on the, on this. 
Totally. And I would just say two quick reactions to that. I mean, I'm sure you've read this. Gigi's piece is really good on this. About He kind of goes into, into great detail about why a credit-based monetary system doesn't work for the internet and why attention became the pseudocurrency. And, um, you know, very high level of, you know, I, I would recommend everyone read it. It's an excellent piece. But like, you know, you're, if you're using Stripe, you have whatever the 2.9% uh, fee plus 25 cent transaction fee, like you just can't do microtransactions. And without microtransactions, it limits the um, types of business models that you can pay for. And so if you're, you know, subscriptions work and they work in a lot of cases, but it limits the creative uh, ability of developers and entrepreneurs to test. And so what has emerged is like people want easy frictionless things, but as you said, nothing's free, right? Like they have real server costs. And so in order to pay for that, yeah, attention has become the default pseudocurrency. You know, Facebook is quote unquote free, um, but how free is it really if it, you know, warps your mind and sucks your time? And, and, I, and I think it's just like one thing that I hope Bitcoin helps solve is like attention is the most valuable thing everyone has, full stop. And uh, to give it away for free is just is wild to me. And I, I don't even like these like micro pay things. I know some people like this, like, oh, you know, you, you give your attention, you get paid a couple sats. Like, I, I think your attention is like so much more viable. Like your attention is like, is it's more valuable than Bitcoin. Like it, attention is the only thing that really matters at the end of the day. And so my hope is that Bitcoin is a much, um, is a much better, better inter, uh, money for the internet. So we can come up with new business models that are much fairer and save your attention. So that's, that's where I hope we're headed. Yeah, and I think it all comes down to centralization versus decentralization. Like AWS and Netflix are great examples. They're inefficient models to send all the data to a, a major s server. It has to get fed back, but then ultimately there's also just like the, the natural um, censorship that can come with it. And so there's a lot like that ends up when you have just inefficient like systems of architecture set up. And this would tie into all of that. Yeah. One thing, uh, oops, sorry, did you want to say something? No, no, go ahead. Um, one thing that I wanted to just also add on there is even before we jump into Nostra and AI, um, you were kind of talking about this a little bit. One of my big obsessions and one of the things I've been kind of spearfishing for as a VC for the last year and a half um, is this idea of how to create a better algorithm for indexing information. And so um, I put out this piece about a year and a half ago called, or maybe, maybe it was a year ago, I don't know, but it called it How to Disrupt Google. And the thesis of the piece is very simple. Google came about in the early days of the internet when they basically, they started by backlinking. They had this concept of page rank, which is basically trying to say if a piece of information links to another piece of information, if you can borrow from that first piece of information's reputation, then you can better index um, what's valuable and what's not. And so the way they kind of bootstrap that, to the best of my understanding, hearing this from DK, is they basically just start with stanford.edu. If you link back to stanford.edu, is like, okay, this must be legit. And they kind of grew out from there. Um, and that's worked for a while. And obviously it was a big breakthrough. That's why Google beat out Yahoo and all these other, you know, um, worse indexed information repositories. But even, you know, prior to me really getting into Noster, I've been noticing for years that Google is just becoming like really terrible, right? Like anytime I Google something, I'm getting SEO crap. It's not like real information. And so what I noticed myself doing was inputting whatever it is I wanted to search for plus Reddit at the end of time. I do that too. Well, it turns out we're not alone. Like as I was going down this rabbit hole last summer, I found there's a Hacker News article. Uh, I think it's the 11th most upvoted article in Hacker News ever. And basically like all of the nerds do this, like literally all of us. And, or they add Reddit or Stack Overflow or whatever form, because you want real human information. And so I started reading different people's takes on this. And I think some people had some really good ideas, but they were missing the Bitcoin piece. But my big takeaway was, what if we could do something like value rank or market rank, right? Which you basically can take information. And now that we have, the only things that are scarce are human attention and Satoshis. And once we have Satoshis, we can now associate information and Satoshis together. That's a brand new human construct, a brand new fundamental construct. And with that, we can build much better indexing, um, you know, systems, and it's not coincidental. Just you know, as Bitcoin came about, as the financial system was in ruins and collapsing, uh, I think that this ability to associate information with scarce value is coming about. Just as LLMs are about to increase the amount of like information out there by orders and orders and orders of magnitude. I don't think that's coincidental. And so that's like one of the big ideas that I'm spending a lot. I have been spending a lot of time uh, investing in different companies, taking different approaches to that. Ooh. Yeah, that is that is so interesting because 
you, the, you, the, the big theme here that you're hitting on is that the the micro transaction currency that that has been possible to have on the internet is attention uh and that's and then your ad payouts happen you know when you a thousand people have seen something for you know scrolling past a page uh for a fraction of a second and that's what has been possible but one for one um it's not the best system uh, and then two machines don't give a shit about you know what ad is on a page they they want the value and and i think i mean i guess we'll get into that a little bit more with um ai stuff here but you know that mega trend is just right there under the surface of like if the internet as we know it is based on on ad on eyeballs and, and attentions uh and attention um you know, from eyeballs, but that's not how it's going to be when when machines are trying to find valuable information and exchange, um, you know, what they need um, with other machines or, or resources in the physical world. And now there's an, an internet internet native currency that can travel at the speed of light and can be fractionalized, um, you know, to to two point one quadrillion sats. Um, and probably even beyond there, uh, in, in order to satisfy every single possible use case of a fractionalized, uh, you know, machine's needs. Uh, it, it, and, and when you put it in those terms, which I think you've done a great job of, like that end state becomes so clear. I think we struggle to see like, how is, you know, how is the internet going to be different five, 10 years from now? But if you think about that, that 30 plus year time frame, it, it's almost easier to see, um, you know, what, end state things move towards in that sense at least and ladies and gentlemen jesse has been noster btc ai pilled in 25 minutes <laughs> <laughs> well, no, i mean this provides this is providing a good segue into noster because the sort of value indexing that you just explained max is is beginning to materialize on noster um via zaps and you can find trending topics or notes that surface because people have sent sats to that particular post. And so that's used as an index to say, Hey, there's probably some signal here. If people are parting ways with Bitcoin to uh, give a, give a nod of um, approval or uh, acceptance to a particular post. And so with that jumping off point, we've brought up Noster a lot, but to help the audience who may be a bit ignorant to what Noster is and what it's trying to achieve, uh, what is it? How does it work and how does Bitcoin fit into it? Yeah. So I think Noster is very simple. And because it's so simple, that's why I'm so excited about it. So it's nodes and other stuff transmitted by Relay, which of course created by, you know, a uh, shadowy super coder like Satoshi. It's someone of a pseudonym, Fiat Job. And I think that's a great sign, right? It wasn't like some corporation or something like that. And um, it was a little bit even tongue in cheek with the name, which I like. But the, the concept behind it is really simple, which is that our current internet works on a client server model. And what that means is I have my client, I, I have like whatever the Twitter app on my phone or Instagram or whatever it is. And I send a message. I'm sending that message from my client, my phone to their server. And that's a server controlled by a company, Facebook or whoever. Then another client, Another, you know, your friend that wants to see your post makes a call, their phone does, to the Facebook server saying, give me this message, right? Now, in the early days of Twitter, um, you know, background, whatever it was, 2011, 2012, 2013, a lot of people may remember, you know, the Twitter API was open. And because it was open, you had all these really cool experiences that were built on top of it. Developers could basically take all that data, all that rich data from Twitter that, you know, had a huge social graph and all kinds of people using it. And then they could build their own experiences, things like TweetDeck or whatever it is. Then around that time, um, I know that, uh, you know, basically they realized, well, shit, the only business model that we see right now, or at least the, the ones that, you know, a lot of people in the company were pushing for was attention, right? Ads. And if the eyeballs, to your point, Jesse, that was the currency's eyeballs. If the eyeballs are going to tweet deck instead of Twitter, well, now all of a sudden we don't have a business model, right? And so they basically closed down the API and the third party, um, you know, uh, development basically stopped or, you know, they didn't totally close all the API, but it was no longer open and permissionless. 
And, you know, obviously Jack's spoken a lot about this and, you know, he and others there seem to have been pushing a lot more for it as a protocol, but it was a business. And, you know, that's just the, the nature of the incentives and, and where it was at that time. What Noster then proposes is, is there a way that we can basically rebuild every application on the web so that the data is always permissionlessly available to build whatever experience you want on top of that? Oh, by the way, can we have a shared identity and social graph between all of those different apps? Now, one approach to doing something like this would be to build a completely, you know, either a completely peer-to-peer -peer system or a system where, um, you know, kind of like Bitcoin, everyone has a shared global state. And this is what all the, you know, the Web3 crypto token projects tried to do. The problem is that's extremely expensive for everyone to agree on a shared global state. You know, th that's why you have all this hash rate with mining, adding a new block every 10 minutes, and still you don't know if it's really, quote unquote, the truth of the world until many minutes later. And we can go on a whole rabbit hole of just, by the way, there is no such thing as global state or truth anyway. So that's, that's like impossible to achieve. But peer to peer or, you know, something where you have a global state that everyone agrees on. Um, is very difficult to scale and basically has on scale. Projects like Urban have tried to do this. Also, with, you know, th th there's a lot of reasons that's very difficult to do. So what Fiat Joff realized, though, is that maybe there's a middle ground. And the middle ground is we can still have effectively a client server model, but instead of having one server controlled by a company, what if we have any arbitrary number of servers, basically a marketplace for servers? Um, and a relay is not exactly a server, but you can think of it like that. So the way Nostra works is it says, okay, you know, from any of my applications, my identity is a public key. So it actually uses the same uh, ECDSA elliptic curve digital signature algorithm that Bitcoin uses. So my 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 identity in Nostr is literally just a Bitcoin public key. It doesn't have to be Bitcoin, but it's kind of interesting because that gives you a lot of cool properties. And from that, I can sign any message with my private key. And people can know with 100% certainty until ECDSA gets broken that whoever owns that public key signed that message. But instead of sending that to Twitter server or Facebook server, I send it to 15 different servers and maybe some of those are in the U S and some are in Singapore and some are in El Salvador and some are in uh, Nigeria and it's pretty distributed. And so because of that, you have all these different messages. You can think of it as like have this giant global data pool and with this giant global data pool, anyone can then go and access those messages and build whatever experience they want on top of it. And there's just like, this allows for so, so many things. Like, I, I don't think, I don't think anyone realizes how big of a deal Nostra is yet. In fact, I think it's what's going to bring Bitcoin mainstream. But what people have been focused on today is primarily social media. And so today you've got, you know, these various clients like Domus, Primal, Amethyst, all these different clients that basically take all that data that's published to all these different relays and then surface that um, as essentially a Twitter-like experience. Now there's two key differences between the Twitter experience that you had on the centralized app and in Noster. One of those key experiences is that you can port your identity and social graph with you. So as an example, I created my private key that I currently use on Noster in Domus. I then exported that, put it in my Albi wallet extension, was able to go and log on with Primal online or now on my phone with the same identity. I have the exact same followers and follows. That's very, very powerful, right? That's the first like mind blown aha moment. The second thing that we've seen is, and this didn't have to happen, but because all the Nostra developers were Lightning developers, we've seen what are called zaps. And this is like what I was talking about with Stacker News, the same concept where you upvote a piece of content. Zaps are natively integrated into most of these apps as well. And so what that means is all of a sudden now, um, you know, unlike with Twitter, where all I can do is pay with attention or hearts, now I can actually pay with value. And so th th there's so many other things this is going to open, and we can talk more about this, but like the Google indexing idea is going to work much, much, much better than I had even originally imagined in an old web world. I thought in the old web world that you would need to build a new forum like Reddit, which is, you know, Stacker News, or you would do something like Albi and drop Satoshis on the old web and create what I call the Satoshi depth layer. But in this new Nostra world, because Zaps are natively integrated, you have not only the um, value graph, which is who Zap to, but you have a social graph and a persistent social graph. So you know, oh, this person, like for example, if a random account spins up and Zaps, you know, a study saying smoking is good for you, well, maybe that's like Marlboro or something. You shouldn't give them a whole lot of trust. But if Jack Dorsey Zaps something, okay, that's interesting. Even if he Zaps a lot less, because he has a reputation. And so there's a lot more you can do with that, but. Um, this is all just kind of phase one is social media. The next phase is where things get really crazy. I don't think this is what people have realized fully yet. Any application that you can imagine on your phone or on the web 
is strictly better as an Oscar app, full stop. And the reason is because if you can take that identity and graph with you to that app, you can now not only reduce friction to like sign in, but you can have brand new product experiences that were not possible before. So first it was social media, but then you're starting to see music apps. Wave Lake is integrated in Oscar. It's an app where you can listen to music. Stemster is doing really cool stuff where you can build um, like tracks from the ground up. Like you can lay down a beat, someone can rap on top of it, remix it, all happening over Noster. You're going to then see, uh, you know, Goodreads could get rebuilt there, LinkedIn, whatever you want. And the crazy thing is then imagine you could build a new experience where you say, you know, it could be a hiring app or a dating app or just whatever, a friend app, whatever. And you say, recommend to me the 10 people I should meet based on what they listen to on Spotify, who follows them on Twitter and what books they've reviewed. Pretty interesting. And you can't do that in the old web. So th those are some of the kinds of new product experiences that I'm waiting for. And the last thing I just want to throw out, and I know I'm going on a bit of a monologue here, but I think this is like very important, is marketplaces. And I think people are going to be blown away with how big of a deal marketplaces are on Nostra. Because if you think about what is a marketplace, all it is is it's text. It's a bid and an ask. Well, that's what Nostra does. And so if I can publish my bid and my ask to multiple relays, all of a sudden what's going to happen there, I think, is you're going to get a shared backend, a shared order book or a shared liquidity pool. And so if you, for example, imagine local Bitcoins, there are companies that are playing with this idea. You do everything, you know, instead of one company that's, oh, by the way, easy to shut down, you can send your bid and ask to buy and sell Bitcoin to 15 or 20 different servers in 15 or 20 different countries. And lots of front ends can pop up to be, you know, the easy way people interact with that. All of a sudden, though, that shared protocol level marketplace is going to destroy any company. Like imagine if all of a sudden Binance, Kraken, and everyone else shares the same order book, but Coinbase doesn't. Coinbase is going to get trounced. And that I think that's the world that we're headed for, for all marketplaces. Yeah. It's, like when you describe it that way, it's going to force like companies' hands to actually participate in the network. And I, and I think you really highlighted the benefits on the user side, but likewise on the company side, it's crazy because if you can actually build a good client, a good front end, produce a good service for Nostra users, you can bootstrap a user base much quicker than any of the incumbent tech firms out there. The, the, the amount of time it took Twitter, Instagram, Facebook to bootstrap a user base is significantly diminished on Nostra if you're providing a good service. Yeah, it's network, it's network effects, the protocol instead of the app which a hundred percent, like imagine if you build some super weird niche music app, like, or, or even like, I remember like the feature Dom has put in for like left-handed users. Twitter's never going to put a left-handed feature on there because there's not that many left-handed users. People don't care about it. But like the people that are left-handed love it. So now if I wanted to do just, I could even do my own super weird left-handed music app. And maybe there's only a thousand people in the world that like it, but you know, all the people that already have access to the old Twitter apps or the old, sorry, Nostra apps for Twitter, and then the Nostra marketplaces, whatever, all of those users, I inherit all of them potentially to log into my new weird app. And if I happen to bring on, you know, 10 new people just for my left-handed weird long tail music app, they can now log into any of the other Nostra apps. Like once you understand like the super network effects that are spinning here, it, I think this is the new web. Like I think the old web is not, like, I think Nostra eats the web. Max, can you pull on more of, you said a very bold statement. It sounds correct, but just like help us understand, or me understand like, it basically creates a better app than anything else if it can if it if it's interoperable, but like how does that in practice like would it play out or or I guess in theory how would it play out play out? Well, first of all, there's just less friction, right? So like imagine you don't have to create a special account to log into Spotify, or you don't have to log into Facebook because you haven't used Facebook in 25 years or <laughs> whatever it is, and so you know just the login experience you have one universal login for everything and you control it. It's not uh, dependent on a centralized company, which may go under or get bought and change hands and like whatever. So that's the first, just like super obvious way. And then you can start to build really cool kind of weird experiences on top of it. Right. So again, the, the example I give of like, imagine, you know, if you're trying to hire someone or, you know, uh, you had a dating app or something and you said, I want a recommendation, but based across these 10 different apps, music, books, work experience follows. That's an experience that cannot be built in today's world. And so, uh, and then not to mention you have the payments baked in. How crazy is it going to be when you start to see some of these like, um, 
you know, influencer types or whatever, start realizing, wait, I can like post my music here and just get paid directly. And I can make way more than I can make on YouTube. Like this is a value for value for podcasting idea on steroids. Um, so there's just like, I, I think if I had to like sum it up in one idea, permissionless development allows for like all kinds of like, it's a Cambrian explosion of creativity. We don't even know what the big apps are going to be. And that's what excites me as a venture capitalist is we have no idea. I mean, the ones I'm coming up with are cool, but like, I'm sure there's you know, people like Pablo are going to come up with things that are hundred X cooler than I could ever imagine. And so the point is now you've unleashed the global creativity of anyone that can code. And by the way, it's, you know, the, the, um, Nostra protocol, I think it's like a JSON blob with seven fields. It's like super basic. So almost anyone, if they know JavaScript, they can get on there and start playing around experimenting. As you lower the barrier to experimenting, the like number of weird experiments that can get run is just going to be wild. Yeah, I think uh, music will end up, and I, I know you're on, there's like music will be the canary and one of the canaries in the coal mine because it's been so messed up for so long. And I remember Marty uh, and I were chatting with Michael and the Wave Lake team, and it's just like inherently you knew there was something, a better way. You just didn't know what. Uh, yeah. And it was basically getting out of the, getting rid of the middleman was a part of it. And this feels like there's, there's definitely like one of the first use cases would be here. Yeah. And for listeners too, like, so wave Lake, they're uh, essentially a music player with lightning network uh, baked into it and do pure value for value. As Max mentioned, they're hooked into Noster as well. So like to play you through the user experience on the artist side, like historically, as Michael mentioned, they've, gotten the shit end of the stick when it comes to dealing with their labels and their distributors of their music and then the streaming platforms like Spotify. Now what we're seeing is this robust environment of uh, now a Nostra, different clients, music clients popping up uh, and all an artist has to do is put their lightning network address in and they can get paid directly um, by their listeners as they're listening to the music. They can put a paywall and say, hey, if you want to listen to this song, pay a cent worth of Bitcoin. Then it gets really interesting too. Like all these artists, they have bands, they have producers, they have managers. Like you can literally get granular, so granular that you can put not only your lightning address in as an artist, but your bandmates, your producer, uh, your manager on a per song basis and automatically distribute revenues to them as they're coming in, which is pretty, pretty insane to think. And then Max, I think we could tie lightning network Noster and AI into one theme here, uh, building on something that Pablo built, who you mentioned earlier, which is data vending machines. And this is, in my mind, one of the most exciting things going on in Bitcoin, AI, and Noster, and, and the intersection of the three is this idea of data vending machines, the ability to essentially uh, tap into a market of AI agents that'll do tasks for you. Well, so, like, before, before jumping in there, I think uh, the music thing where there's like good examples of where the music industry from like an actual utility, you have like, uh, and I'll mess up in some of this, but it's just like you had the, um, a, uh, not a track. What, what's the spinny? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. You had, a, you had a vinyl and then you went to like whatever a track cassette CD. And then when it went into digital form, like how do we cons consume, uh, music? You have like these different formats whether it's like torrenting or you just go and buy it directly via Apple or you uh, just pay for Spotify. And so it's starting to shake these different forms of the internet and it's still broken. Like it's still the, I mean, I think music musicians, uh, we probably have to get the wavelength guys on because they'd be able to explain this better than us, but it's just like, it's been fucked for, for a long time, not just, you know, 20 years. It's been even before that when it comes to the labels and the ownership and the distribution and who owns the rights and so it's still like that, but now you start moving that further and further to the edges of like the value to it. So I think we, you start just, it, it sounds so crazy when we talk about it because it seems so far off, but within the past 10 to 20 years, that whole industry has completely changed. Totally. And, and uh, yeah, before we dive in the AI stuff, I just want to comment on the music stuff as well, because I think this, this is really important to me on, on many fronts. One, some of you guys may know, I, uh, I make my own music as well. I rap. And so one of the big challenges that musicians have is not just getting paid. But like my buddy and I, um, Pablo, we put out, we released under a couple of different names. One is AI, interestingly enough. And, you know, we put it out there and somehow we started getting a lot of people listening in France. I'm going to say a lot, like tens of people. It's not like we have a huge following or anything. But we have no way of contacting these people. We have no idea who they are, how they found us. 
Um, they listen to us every month, which is super cool, but Spotify is not sharing that information with us, right? So in this world, it's not just the payments, but it's also by having a platform where we can have that relationship with our audience and be able to message them. That would be like extremely valuable to us and I'm, for every musician out there. So I think there's a lot of ways this is going to subtly change. I also think the music industry is ripe for some pretty major business model disruptions. I was talking this weekend with my buddy who is a music fan, obviously, but also like a more traditional hedge fund guy. So I would not say he's as open on some of these crazy ideas like Noster. But, you know, I forget the exact numbers, but something like, you know, movies are obviously worth some multiple of the total music market right now. And esports and gaming is maybe like an order of magnitude more. It was a lot more. But his general point was like, look, like music is still very important to lots of people. For me, it's certainly the most important medium. A lot of people have a strong emotional connection to it. The old business model just got rocked by Napster. And the Spotify model kind of worked, but these guys still aren't profitable. So like no one's really figured out a sustainable way for artists to, to thrive yet. And yet they're producing this thing for society, which I think many people would argue music is one of the most fundamental, I don't know, like pieces of humanity. And um, we would love to see a long tail of really good artists continue to thrive. And so I think we're going to see with Noster, because again, it's open, you're going to see all kinds of new experiments around business models. So one of them is the Zap splits for sure. But also, you know, Waverly recently launched this demo with Adam Curry's new podcast, where he is the DJ. I mean, you know, obviously he was the original uh, VJ for MTV as well, which is kind of cool coming first full circle, where he's quote unquote licensing these songs. And so any anyone that zaps those songs while he's playing them, um, you know, he takes a cut for being the curator. And then obviously then you could have zaps all the way back down for whoever worked on that on that track. And I think it's also going to create this like really interesting business model around being a curator. I think part of my like big thing around this disrupting Google is human curation, finding the quote unquote weights of what a model should be is something that I think humans are going to be sort of the best at still for a very long time. And I think that allowing you know, people to curate books and music and all this stuff, it's going to create a big sort of new job opportunity there. Um, I think we're just scratching the surface of that. So I'm, I'm pretty bullish. Oh, and by the way, with Stemster, you know, Wave Lake is dope because it's just like taking music and, you know, opening up new business models. Stemster, you know, they're doing even crazier stuff because they're actually using, um, people are building tracks on Stemster, right? So I share a file and it's just a beat and I share it openly, but then that beat and the way it's, it's released, you know, that's, uh, I forget if it's MIT license or some kind of open copyright, um, anyone can use it, remix it, and soon they'll add in zaps. So you add in a beat, 10 different people rap on it, you now have a marketplace for which of those tracks ends up blowing up the most and you get paid for all of them, right? Like these are brand new concepts that just did not exist before and it's, yeah. it's wild. This is a this is such an exciting conversation because like I think about one of the big things in in venture and in Bitcoin is like the thing that most it gets lost on people is user experience and what is going to change somebody's user experience or not user experience but user uh, behavior in what they do and you reference like um, humans and curation and it was like when Marty when I got really excited wave like because I remember during COVID it's like the one thing that people will depart their money for when you go to like a restaurant or they did it on YouTube is you'd put your cash app and you would send them dollars via it because there's some like deep meaning there and so it's like of course they pay for this in any form because they're just tied to it and it doesn't matter if they have to like download a crazy application they will do it to get the value to them and then something else that I've never heard but you mentioned about like humans and uh curation and it's like always going to be there no matter what ai or programmatic and it's like a business is the highest form in my and that just hit me in, in curation like you're curating these like individuals and you're going out to the market to produce value and so like that's like the micro or like a, a subset of that totally and, and by the way this is something i think a lot about as a an investor as well you know there's a lot of factors you want to look for in a good entrepreneur and the biggest thing is just timing the way right which that that's tr tricky to do but you know, part of what I ask is this person super smart, are they in the right place at the right time? Or I think that it's close enough to the right time they can last, you know, for, for the wave to hit. But then in my opinion, the truly great companies, right? Like the ones that last for decades, Apple being the greatest example of this ever, it comes down to taste. It's always taste. You want like the, the best investments are people with the best taste, full stop. Yeah. And pause. <laughs> well, that's, well, that's the other thing too. Now thinking about this as well, like particularly with Noster, like what is this going to do in terms of like unlocking people with good taste that maybe weren't able to surface their taste in, in the incumbent system? Like 
in terms of like human capital being unlocked via this network topography, like it's it's going to be insane. You're going to have anons on Noster that are just tastemakers and maybe they weren't comfortable doing that in the incumbent system because they have to tie their identity to it to some form or another. 100%. And, and you know, and a lot, and like, yeah, it's going to unleash, you know, people from all over the world can do this. And like a lot of like, you know, taste that that's how it's happened around the internet. Like a lot of, you know, modern taste came from weird, you know, corners of Tumblr or probably 4chan at first or weird, Tumblr, you know, corners of Reddit. And then they went mainstream and like, yeah, this is going to accelerate all of that. And by the way, someone else I saw like a, an investor about had some pretty good ideas. You know, one of his big ideas is that the meme economy still has not been uh, well monetized. Like people that are able to make good memes, there's a huge opportunity around that. I'm not sure what it is yet, but if you're an entrepreneur working on that and you, you think you have a way to help the great meme monitor, uh, makers monetize, I'm very interested. That's why fiat is such a travesty because everybody always thinks it's like this dogmatic or whatever. It's like it's the old Peter Thiel quote of like we were promised flying cars and we got the 240 characters. It's like you have these 80,000 or now it's probably 180,000 employees at Google. They could be doing taste making. They could be doing like what they really want to be doing. But it's just like the golden handcuffs and all the other things that, you know, are from that. Um, so, yeah, we're just like, we're just on, on the, the, the edges of seeing what that all will look like. Totally. Yeah. And that, I mean, I guess we can talk about AI now too. Like, <laughs> cause that's great. Like we're talking about human experiences here and this is when Cody, Cody Lowe first explained what was going on with AI and L402. It's a lightning 402 specification that, uh, lightning labs dropped years ago, formerly LSATs. Uh, but the, uh, the law, industry came after them for running with that. So it got rebranded to L402. Um, what we're talking about is just like humans interacting and sending Bitcoin to each other over these networks. But once you begin to grok what's going on at the intersection of the Lightning Network and AI particularly, that's where things get really heavy because especially for the audience listening to this, one of the concepts in their mind is total addressable market like the total addressable market is moving beyond humanity and into this machine world with ai which is literally unfathomable we don't know the end state of the impact that ai will have and how much activity will be going on in aggregate a decade from now two decades from now a century from now um but it's become pretty clear to me and i'm pretty sure the others sitting here on this show right now that the AI, like you said earlier, is not going to have a bank account with JP Morgan. They're going to want the native currency of the internet. And so, yeah, Max, like how are you viewing this intersection and the potential opportunity that lays before everybody? Well, I mean, look, there, there's so much to say here. And so I'll give maybe a little overview, but happy to go into any of the areas you want. I, I put out a piece on my blog or an essay, um, hivemind.bc slash AI, where I, I kind of go into everything in, in more detail. High level, I think, again, we're at a turning point. I think we're at a turning point in many different areas. Um, AI, and and when we say AI, there's a lot of different you know things that can mean. Large language models are what are getting most of the attention today. And you can think of that as just like a way to compress all of the world's information and like get information out of it faster than you can, for example, with a Google search. Uh, and then obviously do it in a way that's chainable with other AIs. And, but, I, you know, I, again, it's like in some ways, I, I think it's both underhyped and overhyped. Overhyped in that I, I think this has very little to do with like consciousness or like, you know, whatever, like super intelligence. I'm, I'm very skeptical of a lot of those things. I keep an open mind, but I do think it's a very powerful tool. And it's a powerful tool that can, for the right users, amplify their own intelligence by orders of magnitude. So for, you know, really good software engineers are already becoming 10x or 100x engineers from that. And they'll probably be 1,000x engineers. Same is going to be true for whatever it is you're good at. Like you're going to have a personal assistant that can amplify your own intelligence and abilities quite a lot. But I, I personally am just, I don't really buy into a lot of this like AGI stuff very much. Um, although I'm happy to talk more about that if you guys want. But I, the, the term, oh, sorry. Oh, so I was just like, oh, that's interesting. That I would, I would have thought that you would um, subscribe to that uh, AGI, uh, you know, super intelligence, Nick Bostrom um, school of thought. But no, oh, interesting. No, I mean, I, I read all of that back in the day. Like, I read super intelligence back in 2014. I remember at the time I was terrified. Yeah, like, it messed me up at the time. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Like, literally, I couldn't sleep for a week, and and like, you yeah. know, and I, I have a bit of a weird, you know, taking all this and that I. 
you know, in, in 2018, I was kind of deciding, do I go all in on AI or Bitcoin at the time? And now it's kind of coming back around. But a lot of my roommates, you know, I'm here in San Francisco, they were all, you know, at OpenAI yeah. and they were at Google or DeepMind. And so I've kind of had like a, you know, observer seat just listening to them. And, you know, look, to be clear, all these people are way smarter than I am. So like, I take this with a giant grain of salt. I'm just kind of going with my own intuition. But I think that, um, well, I, I think first of all, one of the the people that I really respect the most, like there's few, there's a few thinkers that have really shaped me. Buckminster Fuller is one. Kevin Kelly is another. I think Kevin Kelly is just like generally almost always right, or at least on, on most topics I've seen him. And he has this basically, con- he has a lot of interesting concepts. But one of them is that, you know, if I had to summarize, he's like more, um, you know, he's not a utopian. He calls it protopia, which is that we can make progress without it being perfect. Like whenever we have a big new technological breakthrough. Um, it, it opens up lots of new possibilities and it also opens up lots of new bad things too. Of course, it's, it's just like the internet allows for all kinds of incredible collaboration and it allows for really fucked up things too. And like, that's just, that's technology. It's a tool, but his general kind of like, just, which I, I don't know why I just like intuitively agree with is that over the long arc, it's, you know, a tiny percentage point, even if it's only 1% quote unquote good. And, and I think one way you can define good is by, if you think about like, you think about the universe as like an evolutionary force. And I think humanity is kind of just an arbitrary piece of all of this. But like, if you think that there was a force that existed or some point of energy that then expanded into all that is now, um, you know, what, what it appears from my vantage point that the universe quote unquote wants is novelty and more options, right? Like if you're a single point of infinitely dense energy or something, it's like kind of boring, but the more you expand out and the more possibilities are open, the more different kinds of ways you can be yourself interacting with yourself or the more kinds of movies you can watch. And I think that's kind of what's happening. I think what he calls the technium, which is the technological force, I would just call it the, 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 the life force behind everything um, of which both humanity and technology are both parts. Um, it, it's pointing in a direction of more options, more choices, more possibilities, which I think on a compounding long time scale is generally good. Now, one of the points he makes with AI, which I think is really important that I agree with, is that, you know, a lot of the AGI folks, first of all, they have this concept that there's one thing that is intelligence and that humans are, quote unquote, generally intelligent. And I just completely disagree with that. There's no such thing as general intelligence and humans are not the top of the food chain either. Like, if you think about it, first of all, what does it mean to be generally intelligent, right? Evolutionarily speaking, everything that's alive and here today and thriving is kind of equal. Like I saw, instead of having like an evolutionary like ladder, a better way of describing evolution is like a disc that as it spreads out in time, if it's still here, it's just as evolved as we are. It's just gone down a different um, pathway. So fungi and bacteria and cockroaches and alligators and all of these things have been around a really long time. And we all have different kind of types of intelligence. And I'm not saying there's not something particularly interesting about humans, clearly there is, but like, um, you know, squirrels, so the example he used, they had this remarkable ability to remember where exactly where they buried thousands of different acorns for many, many years. Humans can't do that. Is that not intelligence? It's a form of intelligence, right? And so I think this is one of the big things that I just take, you know, major issue with is like, I know people that are extremely intelligent, you know, like on, on tests, right? Like they, you know, one guy knows an alternate for the U.S. national math team, incredibly intelligent, way more analytically smart than I will ever be able to sniff. But I wouldn't say he's necessarily socially adept as much. And that's a different kind of intelligence, right? So I, I just think there's many different kinds of intelligences. And um, I, I think it's going to go much more like evolution where there's going to be ecosystems of different intelligences, both cooperating and competing. And, you know, the big heartbeat of life goes on. And uh, anyway, so that's, that's why I'm skeptical of AGI. But um, yeah, I, I, I think what's much more like, so, but, but I do think we're at a turning point. One option is we have these centralized top-down companies that, you know, I, I am kind of afraid of. I'm not afraid of the AGI takeoff. I am afraid of, you know, you know imagine the Chinese government or OpenAI or someone, even if they have good intentions, becoming so powerful and deciding, no, actually, we know what's best for all the other humans. And we're going to use this new superpower because it is a very powerful tool to you know restrict people from experimenting and trying things and i think that's really dangerous and that that's my kind of fear on the other end of the spectrum you have a world where you say look you know the kind of like eac let it rip camp and i'm not saying i'm all the way there like obviously like there are i don't know like nothing is completely black and white but but i'm generally in the camp of you know 
the human mind is marvelous, but it's a subset of evolutionary intelligence. And the best way to like guard against something really bad happening is let evolution run its course, let, you know, competing artificial intelligences evolve along with the super powerful ones you're thinking of and blah, blah, blah. And that's kind of the, the, the mode that I'm looking for is a more decentralized community of AIs that work in tandem with each other and with humans. And together we build this, you know, decentralized hive mind with call it 8 billion human minds, 8 trillion artificial minds or more. And we're using something like Noster as our open protocol for communication and something like Bitcoin and Lightning as our open protocols for commerce. And that's that's the direction I see it heading. Yeah, that's, that's a, a more optimistic, uh, I, I forget exactly how Bology frames this, but he, he, I think he said like this decade or the century is going to be uh, you know, a story of, of AI and, and China centralizing AI versus Bitcoin and libertarian values in the West uh, decentralized in, in a decentralized approach. And uh, what you're presenting there is really the decentralized version of super intelligence uh, in the future. And that's a much more optimistic one than the dystopian top down authoritarian, you know, Chinese um, dream uh, that, that, you know, they will be heading towards and hopefully, um, you know, the free market capitalist uh, nature of a decentralized version uh, can beat out that top down authoritarian style because if it doesn't then it, then it is the dystopian uh, dark future um but you know i think that the history of uh, of how communism lost to um free markets uh, might play out again in, over this century too i took a very bar uh, left barbell approach to this one morning i was like thinking about all this and freaking out because i think marty had texted me he's like i just went down this deep dark rabbit hole on on <laughs> agi and i was like well if if Bitcoin fixes this, if Bitcoin's money, somebody has to plug in the computers. Like they need fuel. So, and you keep, that's how you keep everyone honest in that world where you have infinite number of money that's like in, in the proxy for today's world is like the military industrial complex where you print these dollars and you take them from other individuals and that's how you power, you know, this like, you know, dictator slash kind of like overarching form of um, government. Versus in this world that we're talking about, like if you need to power whatever, whether it's nefarious or positive, like you need a form of money that cannot be printed and they need to consume it to be able to function, to do whatever's needed. That is like the, the balancing act in that whole world. And if you don't have that, then we're basically not in a good spot. But if you have this unit that is it's equally or as equal as possible distributed that you can't print more of it that starts to weigh the checks and balance on like what the, how you can impose that. Yeah, yeah. and it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying at the very beginning, which for me, Bitcoin, like forget crypto, forget what everything we think we know about money. Like if Bitcoin is just a ledger of energy, it's an energy backed money and energy is the currency of the universe. And, you know, we just look at evolution and how it's played out. Like again, the whole on thing, holes become parts of a new hole, which become parts of a new hole. We're just getting, we're laying the, the neural, you know, whatever, like um, infrastructure for that next hole. And my guess is energy is still going to be the currency of that because it's the currency of everything. And I think, I mean, this is, you know, Drew gave that excellent talk at the last Bitcoin conference. I think he's just, he's just like, correct. Like this is um, a new organism forming with metabolism and Bitcoin is going to be the sort of uh, digital representation of energy in that metabolism. So. That's what I think we're at. I, I do think it's maybe worth just mentioning sort of like some of the really cool stuff that can that can happen. Like Marty, you brought up uh, the DVNs. I don't know if you guys want to dive into that. Yeah, no, I think just running off of what we just discussed, like, and I completely since Michael, we had that discussion. I've completely backed away from the AGI doomerism. I'm, I'm not going to be a luddite about AI. I think it's here, it's going to happen, and it's good for humanity. Um, but with that being said, like the intersection of Bitcoin and AI, there's many ways in which it's materializing. Like going back to the energy, the L402 payment required paywalls that you can put in front of these uh, API token calls, like that is actually like a step function improvement in how these AI companies can monetize. They know that they can ping their GPUs, present their end users 
with responses uh, and do that profitably because they can get the money up front with Lightning. But then that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just a mechanism to uh, to um, guarantee that there's going to be a payment and you're going to be able to pay your electricity bill at the end of the day. But once you get into things like data vending machines, that's when things get really heady, when you can actually like enter a market as an end user for competing AIs that will do tasks for you. Totally. And I think it's worth noting um, there's a couple of big opportunities I see for Bitcoin and AIs. I think the DVM stuff falls kind of under the agent sort of area, and I'm, I'm looking very close to that. But even taking a step back before we dive in that, I think maybe one thing that's important for listeners to understand is um, the way that quote unquote AI works is very different than the way that other software has worked historically. In the last big, like, let's say, enterprise software wave, you, you had, you know, X amount of money invested to create this new software product, and then you had effectively zero marginal cost of distribution. That's not the way AI works. Because the way AI works is essentially what you're doing is you're taking all of this data and you're, you know, using math that we don't fully understand exactly how it all works, but to compress that into what's called a model, and you're, you're basically using these GPUs, graphics processing units, to do these matrix multiplications that take the data and train them all. And that's, that's what OpenAI and Anthropic and all these companies, Google, have spent you know, billions of dollars training these really big and complex models. But then it's not like you just have this model and anyone can use it for free, right? So there's the training phase of that. Then there's, there's, well, there's really two more phases. One is fine tuning it with your own data, which also you know, requires either electricity or humans doing that. We can talk more about that. Bitcoin's interesting for both. But then you have what's called inference. And inference is, okay, I actually want to run the model. And so if I want to run the model, like every time you ask ChatGPT a question for anyone that's using the ChatGPT interface, and I, if, you, if you haven't li- done it yet, anyone that's listening to this, I definitely recommend you do it because it is pretty mind-blowing. It's a very cool technology. But every time that's, that's happening, OpenAI is running a GPU on their end. And that answer doesn't already exist. They have to run the GPU. Now, that's interesting because every time you run the GPU, that's real-world computation and electricity, which has real-world costs, right? And so when I do that, you know, I don't know the exact numbers, but I've heard, you know, on the order of two to 10 cents uh, per inference, let's say that's expensive. And so if you have a computer with an API that's calling or they're calling your API rather to do a whole bunch of inferences on your GPU, the cost of that can run up super fast and it's not zero marginal cost distribution. It's like, oh shit, like I just spent a million dollars, you know, um, using all these GPUs. Oh, by the way, there's a major GPU shortage. This is why NVIDIA stock has just gone to the moon over the last couple of months for anyone that's, that's, that's following along. And this is one of the reasons OpenAI, you know, Sam Altman's come out and discussed multiple times that they, they, just, they straight up, A, don't have enough um, GPUs to be able to do all the inference that people are asking for right now. Now, a second problem, which it's unclear to me if this is actually a problem for them or not. I've seen anecdotal evidence that suggests it is, but we'll see is in a credit-based monetary system, there's a, a trick there, which is if you're doing calls with um, you know, Visa or MasterCard, as Gigi discussed in that article we mentioned with credit-based money, you, know, you can have chargebacks. And so if you're some rando on the internet, they're not just going to front you a bunch of credit to use their GPU. Well, first of all, if you're a rando on the internet, chances are you're born in a country where you don't even have access to you know, a credit card anyway. And so you have no way of using the system. And even if you do, you know, they're going to be like, what is this random, whatever, Turkish credit card or something? And you may or may not get credit extended. I know at least one instance of someone who's like got you know, a pretty reputable person whose car has been denied over and over. Um, I don't know if that's a problem at scale or not, but it, it could be. And it's certainly limiting their total addressable market. And part of that is if you were able to, instead of doing a credit-based monetary system where you could charge up 100000 or a million dollars worth of uh, GPU cycles, Instead, if you send a bearer asset, i.e. Bitcoin, um, and even if it's denominated as US dollars with Tara or something in the future, that's totally fine. But if you're sending real Bitcoin as the underlying and that can't be clawed back, well, then you can do, you can increase the total addressable size of your market radically because now you know, you know, your profit margin is already baked in and guaranteed. So if it costs you two cents an inference and you're charging three cents an inference, then your you know, cost and your profit is all locked in. So I think that that's a really important concept, both for the big companies and the decentralized AI. But I think if that's one of the key concepts everyone, first of all, just has to understand is that there is no zero marginal cost of distribution here. 
Hmm. Yeah, and then to like throw an antidote on top of that example, I mean, Cody Lowe, who we mentioned earlier, he's the head of developer support at Fetty, which is a company uh, building in the Bitcoin space. And one of the modules that they're going to put in their app is LN Chat, which essentially allows you to get access to OpenAI's ChatGPT after paying a Lightning Network invoice. And he he launched like the the prototype for that called Matador. Yeah. And didn't even market it really. Just put it on some like obscure yeah. dev uh, forums and put it out on Twitter. And he went to bed one night and woke up and realized he had $2,000 worth of charges on his open AI account. Uh, it didn't matter to him. He had $2,200 worth of Bitcoin. So he made a little bit of money. But he said the most fascinating thing uh, that he found from from launching this and running this was he was getting DMs from developers in Nigeria and the Philippines who were saying, thank you for launching this. I've been watching people in the West use these models and I haven't been able to because I don't have a bank account. And so to Max's point there, like just this one developer hacking around on a, on a prototype for just to prove that this could actually be a use case opened up ChatGBT to markets that previously did not have access to it and wait but marty don't you need it don't you need a token for that <laughs> yeah it's called sats um <laughs> just bring it full circle you need to bring it full circle you need sats and you need the the ai uh api token as well it, it, it is it is an interesting point because like i when we well, when we've been talking about all of this stuff like a question that keeps coming in my head is who's going to do that like who's really going to you know, it, we can't even figure out how to use the internet as it is. Like, you know, switching to Nostra is going to be really hard for the average person. But, but there's a solution right there. There's the answer. It's 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 entrepreneurial endeavors to like create workarounds that that help people get things that they want, even if it doesn't feel like you're using Nostra. Like, it, it feels like you're just using the web. Yeah, it's just going to be a better experience. Exactly. I mean, th th this is my thesis as a fund, right? Is like uh, how to make like my dream world is like the average person didn't even know what the word Nostra means or even necessarily Bitcoin. Like they're just like, hey, I have an app that I make money on and it's open and it's cool and that's it. And so when you say, you know, it's, it's hard for the average person to come, dude, we're so early in all this. And so that difficulty is our alpha. Like that's like what I see right. my fund doing is like, how do I now invest in the companies that solve those problems? Yeah. Just obfuscates. It was something that I remember, um, in early days and helping people hold their keys at Unchain and getting the devices and they get so angry, like you were making them go through that process. And I liken it back to like the nineties and the alpha there was setting up the modem and the router and you got access to the World Wide web. And in this version, it's like you're actually securing an asset. You can put like value around that. If you secure it, you're going to have it in the future. It's going to accrue in the same way here. It's just going to look a little foreign and clunky for the early adopters. And if you invest and you're allocating your building in the space, you're going to get outsized returns. And then in the future state, it's just going to be like, you know, obfuscated all the way. And it's just like water flowing down the stream. It's not it's going to be natural state of things. Yeah, everybody's gonna be like, "Oh, it was easy. It was always gonna be this way." Um, it was inevitable. It was inevitable. Yeah, we like Google and Facebook. Like, <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, and I think to, I mean, we're definitely tapping into like why Bitcoin is uniquely suited to serve this simple use case of paying paying uh, a paywall and then getting access to an API token. But like, where it gets really heady, going back to data vending machines um, and AI agents, particularly, like this is really highlights why Bitcoin, particularly over the Lightning Network, is uniquely suited to serve the AI agent use case is because AI agents, you want them to complete a task, they go out on the internet and they do it. And when I think of this use case, particularly and how Bitcoin fits into it, via the Lightning Network, for anybody listening who's not familiar with like the technical aspects of it, like Lightning Network has what are called like macaroon permissions. So you can essentially inject permissions into how Bitcoin is sent and received over the Lightning Network. And what we're going to be able to do, what you can already do, but is very nascent right now, we'll get more mature moving forward, is you can use these macaroon permissions and then give these AI agents like allowances and say, hey, go out and book me a ticket back to Austin between these dates, between these prices, you load up the wallet, 
And then eventually when all the airlines adopt Bitcoin and accept it, it'll be able to go out and use the Bitcoin it has as an allowance to go complete that task for you. And when you think about the amount of time that's going to unlock for individuals, that's insane, number one. But then number two, like you're going to give that AI an allowance and it's going to go out and spend it and it could spend it with another AI agent. Like if it can't complete the task, it's like, all right, I know that you may be able to complete the task. Here's the Bitcoin to go do it. And when you think about the insane market dynamics that can evolve from that, it's hard to even think about. It's hard to even th- fathom. Yeah, I know, Max, you talked about this previously on like your dream. And it's, I think, like when we break down, um, like basically managing your own GPUs from a data privacy perspective and then ingesting the data that you're allowing from your personal just kind of uh, ecosystem of applications that you use sending an agent to go complete task or be able to manage all of that. Um, and that goes from a micro example of an individual, but then to like businesses and the data that they have that's unique to them to wrap around a model. It, it's just unforecastable the amount of like efficiency that will come from that. Well, so yes, a hundred percent. And I think the other thing that it allows for, so efficiency, data privacy, all those things are great and, and they will be big. But I think the really big opportunity here is going to come from the long tail. And what I mean by that is, and so going back to the data vending machine, Pablo came up with this construct where I can send out a job request to the Nostra network for anything. And anyone can come and fill that request for me or compete to fill that request for me. It's basically, it's it's just a way of bringing markets to completing any task. And so if you want to call something closer to AGI, it's this, it's taking any task Um, deconstructing it to its constituent parts, farming each of those parts out to an open free market, i.e. Noster, and then paying that. And, you know, I I think it's going to end up being Bitcoin. And so to give you guys an idea of like what this could be, right? So the first thing that he was doing with the data vending machine was he has this really cool app called highlighter.com. And highlighter.com is kind of like if you guys remember Rap Genius back in the day, I was a pretty big fan of that site. And basically is like a crowdsource annotation for rap songs. Then they raised a whole bunch from Andreessen and tried to do everything. And then, you know, it never really went anywhere. But I think Noster, you know, with highlighter.com, it's really cool because you can basically have any text or book or whatever PDFs and you can annotate them and people can see this in pub, this identity max highlighted this. And then you can start to build cool experiences around it. You know, this is going back to why Noster is sweet. You can have like a social network based on, I want to meet everyone in my community or in my, in San Francisco or in Austin that highlighted this particular document, anyone that highlighted the GG document about money, probably someone I'd like to talk with. Cool. So you can build all those cool experiences around. So one of the things that Pablo then wanted to do was, okay, well, I want to be able to bring audio into highlighter, right? And so instead of just doing this for text, could we do this with podcasts? But obviously podcasts are in, um, you know, voice, it's audio format. And so his first idea for the dating vending machine was, uh, what if I could just, you know, drop a link to a YouTube video or a podcast like this one we're doing right now. And you could basically have the entire Nostra network compete to run models to do transcription for me. And so someone could run like Whisper or whatever open source model or closed source, like whatever they want, or they can have a human do it, right? But that's probably not going to be cost competitive, but try and create these different um, podcast transcriptions for me. And so you can have like an open market for podcast transcription. They can have different prices. They can have reputation that builds up over time. So as your reputation goes up, maybe you can increase your prices, blah, blah, blah. And then you can like have your bot or agent set parameters around how much reputation matters to you, how much cost, all these different things. But then what's really crazy because of the way this works, everything in Nostra is just a kind, or or it's just like an event that you can chain with other events. And so then you can start to have all kinds of, well, you can have very specialized versions of what we just talked about chained together with other really, really interesting events. So the first example he gave was, okay, podcast transcription. You know, maybe OpenAI has a pretty good podcast transcriber, but what if I want to get super specific and I want to have a Bitcoin podcast only transcriber because there's Bitcoin vocabulary that the OpenAI model just may not know about. And so this is what I was talking about fine tuning. You take a model off the shelf and then you basically, you know, wrap your own data into that or the data that you're interested in. And so then you could literally have someone that says, hey, I'll run the generic podcast transcriber for this cost. And it's pretty good. But then you could have someone says, actually, I only do Bitcoin uh, podcasts. So if I hear a term like the happening, I know like what that means and how to transcribe it, whereas the uh, the generic model might not. But then you could then have someone else that comes and says, yeah, that's really great. But you know what? Uh, 
I want to have a model that only tra- transcribes podcasts for the last trade. And that's it. That's it. But we, because we've trained only on listening to you guys, um, to Michael and Marty and Jesse talking, like we know exactly what phrases they like to use. And so we're just the best in the world. No one can beat us at transcribing the last trade. And in the current world, that just like, there's no way open would ever do that. It doesn't make any economic sense. But if it's a giant free market, this is exactly what happened with the internet with Amazon when they said, okay, you know, books in a bookstore, you can't have these weird niche long tail books because it doesn't make economic sense in Barnes and Noble, but you can on the internet. Same thing's going to happen here. You can have all this weird long tail niche kinds of models that maybe only 10 people in the world will ever use, but whatever, you're still making money off of it and you're running the computer at your house. So who cares? So I see, first of all, that's like the first big area this is going to unlock is like the long tail niche, but very interesting or successful models. Then you start to chain those together. And this is where stuff gets wild. Today, one of the biggest um, kind of darlings of Silicon Valley is LangChain. LangChain started as an open source framework for chaining various data sources and bots or agents together. Um, and LangChain, after they got, you know, like whatever, tens of thousands of stars, Benchmark invested in them very quickly. A week later, Sequoia dumped another 20 plus mil or something crazy in there. And they're off to the races. But LangChain is a way to string data and agents together, but it's very top down, right? What DVMs are promising is you can now do kind of what they're doing, but you can do it in a completely open and interchangeable way and obviously with lightning payments. So you could say, as an example, okay, I want to post this podcast link today. Now I want a couple of things done. Number one, I want it transcribed. Then I want it summarized. Then I want it translated to Spanish. And I want someone to create a logo for my site based on this, right? And so you can literally have all these different jobs done each by different agents, some sequentially, some not, depending on like if, if, if one job is required to be done before the other, and anyone can compete for it. And you can do it the first you know, week, and then week two, maybe a better model comes for the stable diffusion to create the logo, and you can keep the other three models the same, but sub that model out. Basically, what this is doing, it's bringing free markets to the world of labor, and increasing labor is going to be done by AIs. And maybe some of it's still going to be human tasks too. That's fine. Humans can be in there too. But um, it's just going to be super wild and very cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of mind-blowing. <laughs> it is mind-blowing <laughs> when you think about it. Um, this is very sci-fi, but yeah. No, but I think to bring it back to like our audience, like who we're speaking to, I think the reason we brought Max on is to highlight like this part of the Bitcoin and kind of like Bitcoin is beginning to leak out of the bubble that it's been confined to for the first 15 years of its existence and really find product market fit at the medium of exchange level with these other open systems. And I I think in the context of the high net worth individuals and institutions that are looking at Bitcoin, I don't think any have really dug this deep into what Bitcoin can offer. They think of it again as digital gold, this inert asset that'll sit in a wallet and accrue value over time. But I think it's really important. I've said this in the past, but I think this episode really reinforces it is that the distributed network and the layers being built on top of it enable things that were literally impossible 15 years ago until Bitcoin launched. And that when you're trying to value Bitcoin and put a total addressable market on it, like again, what Max just described, I don't even think we can fathom what the total addressable market is at the end of the day because we don't even know the type of use cases that are going to be enabled by AI. We can't, we literally can't think of them. Um, And And, and just to bring it to your your audience on all of that, right? Like, I mean, obviously I think there's, you know, if you're thinking about this from an investor perspective, there will be Google sized companies that are built out of this, no doubt, right? Like think about it. Like if you have the opportunity, you know, even if you just wanted to train the really big model out there, right? To compete with open AI. I think one big secret right now is, you know, there's this whole concept of hallucination, which is sometimes the, the models just like make shit up, which to be fair, so do humans, but like, you know, it, it's going to be very hard to go from like 80 or 90% reliability to hundred percent reliability. And the big reason for that is because, well, what are, what is a model train on? It's trained on the internet, right? And like, you know, there's a lot of great stuff on Reddit. There's also a lot of crap. And how do you distinguish, you know, what's good and what's not? So I think a secret that the Nostra and Lightning community has is we have this market rank or value rank concept. So I'm pretty bullish on big models finding some way to incorporate market rank um, to, to basically create the best foundation models in the future. So that, that's one thing. 
Um, I think it's going to be very useful for fine tuning. This is something that stack work has kind of done. Like, hey, I want, you know, you to say like, which of these options is better? Like, you know, not just image labeling, but like which, you know, poem do you like more or whatever? And you can pay people stats to do that. I think that's going to be very interesting. So there's going to be all kinds of interesting, you know, investment opportunities. That's where I spend, you know, basically full time is trying to find what are the thousand or 10,000 X of intro opportunities. On the other hand, the very simple TLDR for anyone is just buy Bitcoin and hold it. Why? Obviously not investment advice, blah, blah, blah. Don't sue me, blah, blah, blah. But, but I mean, the, the general gist there is like, um, you know, to your point about total addressable market, Marty, like I, I think what people are going to be shocked about is Bitcoin, it really does have no top. I know that's somewhat of a, um, a cliche now, but if you think about Bitcoin as GDP coin, and all Bitcoin is, is a representation of the total economic pie for the planet, which is what I think it is, it's, and which is another way of saying the, the potential energy of the human species or human plus whatever species we collaborate with. That's all Bitcoin is. It's just a representation of that potential energy pie. Okay. And we're about to take whatever the global economy is today, and we're going to open it up to 6 billion additional people that are pretty much cut off from it. We're going to open up all kinds of new micropayment use cases, which we haven't even dreamed up. And oh, by the way, the 8 billion humans that are using this, they'll be like one one thousandth of the total number of AIs that are out there doing stuff with economic activity and doing IOT payments and whatever else. Like whoever has the single, like anytime you see an exponential curve and you see someone making a really bullish prediction, like I've never once seen it be like, oh, they were too bullish, right? If you go over a 10 plus year time horizon, even like 10% of the stuff that I'm talking about comes true, then the total global GDP is going to be so many orders of magnitude bigger than we can imagine. Like, and that's going to accrue to Bitcoin because it's the, it's the, you know, the representation of that potential energy. So Max, yeah. but Larry Fink said yeah. it's digital gold. It's it, 10 trillion is the max. It's, <laughs> it, it's the literal max. Uh, the other thing that I think is important is, is not only where, like investable opportunities, but it's also where like disruption will happen because we've seen this and people be displaced in the past, you know, 20 years since the internet. It's just recognizing earnestly, or at least giving enough of a, you know, inkling, like to look into music, telco, all the things that we know essentially will this will touch. So you can start pre preparing or at least knowing that you're the model that you've lived in, in the past 20 years will look very different than the next 20 years. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that's an important function of all of this because the world's going to change faster than we could ever expect. Um, it is. And if I had to leave one additional message on that, like obviously, you know, bullish long Bitcoin, that's cool. But I think that all of the like fear and stuff that I hear, and it's easy, like believe me, like through COVID and being an SF, like believe me, I, I have gotten my own like fear and doom cycles. And it's very easy to do that. I think it's, it's frustrating and sad or whatever. But like, man, like, anyone that's really afraid of, you know, AI run away and all this stuff happening. Like, I just think it's, man, it's such a lack of imagination. Like the future is going to change and it's going to be exciting. And like, you know, look at the end of the day, nothing is guaranteed. Like all of us, we're not going to be here forever. So like, enjoy it. Like, I think that, um, you know, there, there's obviously ways to profit, but it's just going to be like, this is going to be quite an adventure, right? Like you'll be able to tell your grandkids you live through a, transition bigger than the industrial revolution probably on scale of the agricultural revolution like this is i don't know like i wouldn't want to be alive any other time this is awesome so i'm pretty excited about it. i don't know you don't seem too excited <laughs> <laughs> no i mean you know, this is like considering the macro backdrop right now very contentious election season here in the united states obviously there's war that's broken out in different parts of the world and I, i'll be the first to admit i'm very easily pulled into the doomerism that exists out there but i think having this conversation like i'm just extremely optimistic it's all right there in front of us we can build our way out of the strife that many people find themselves in today with the yep. combination Bitcoin, right. open communications protocols, artificial intelligence, it's all right there. Yeah, I was going to say, Marty, like you've probably been the closest to this industry for the longest. And have you seen like the past, let's call it 18 to 24 months, more building, like actual just things go in market than you've ever, it's just insane for the price action, the, the sentiment in the market. It's just been insane to watch. 
No, and I think it's a bit ironic too, because I think technically speaking, this is the longest bear market that we've seen. I think it's only 490 days now at this point. Yep. Um, and I got in in 2013, 2015, comparing this bear market to 2015. I mean, 2015, I mean, I was pretty plugged in back then. People thought Bitcoin was going to die. Like they, they were convinced everybody had exited Bitcoin Twitter. Nobody was talking about it. Like you had to go to BitcoinTalk.org or the dev mailing list to see anybody who was still excited about it. And again, it's ironic because this bear market's longer, but there's never been a more bullish fundamental landscape within Bitcoin than there is today. What's going on? I, I've said this on episodes in the past, but like the inflection points that we're hitting on multiple points, whether it be custody at the protocol level or building uh, at the lightning level, like like Max mentioned earlier, like the dev kits are all hitting a point of maturation where it's easy for anybody to plug in and add lightning to their businesses, their services, um, the implementation diversity that exists out there is pretty robust. Uh, the amount of eyes that are on the code bases is larger than it's ever been. And then true companies providing actual value and utility to individuals like the, the landscape of the the industry has never been more robust, which is again ironic that we're suffering through the longest bear market of all time. Yeah. But again, as Max has mentioned many times, this is where the alpha lies, like being able to recognize and see through the noise of people um, saying that Bitcoin can't scale, can't do these things, is is where the alpha is because we see it every day. It's happening whether you realize it or not. One question I would like to ask you, because I, I do want to say, like, obviously, I'm very optimistic, but, but I am also a realist. And, like, I do think one of the things that I think can help things just really pop in the next 12 months, and I'm, I'm curious you all's take on this. Like, obviously, like, the happening goes off, the price runs, like, that's probably going to get a lot of more interest. That's probably a good thing. Um, but I will say that, you know, this kind of bottoms up adoption of, like, actually using SADs and being able to get in and out of SADs in your local currency and emerging markets, I think that that, to me, can be a pretty clear path for I think for some of the older, more legacy, for example, tech companies, like you know, I've, I've chatted a lot with Cody as well, and I sponsored his last hackathon, like following all that pretty closely. I mean, the engineers love it; they want to do it. A lot of like compliance people are just like, dude, we don't have to deal with Bitcoin. It's just it's a pain in the ass. Like it's cool, but like we just don't want to deal with it. And I do wonder um, if getting easy interoperability with dollars, at least in the short term, I don't know if that's going to come through Taro. I don't know if it's going to come through better interactions from River and Strike and blah blah blah. I do feel like that would probably just make it a lot easier for some of the legacy tech companies to interact. And so on the one hand, I think if that happens, maybe it runs the next 12 months, not not price, but just adoption. Um, on the other hand, it could just go all bottoms up from places like emerging markets and like the US is later to adopt just because you know they see it happening somewhere else and it's like, okay, we need to change our, our tune. I'm curious if you guys have opinions on that. And, you know, I, think I I uh, I just have to say it on the record because I already get in trouble enough behind the scenes. Um, I fundamentally don't believe any of the adoption happens without the top down and capital coming in because the price is the the ultimate arbiter of it. Uh, and liquidity matters, right? So like a billion people having a dollar in an emerging market versus one person putting $10 billion enhances the liquidity profile and making it useful as money from just swinging around in different directions. Uh, and it's very widely unpopular because it's always the nice thing to talk about of, you know, the quote unquote, I think it's a psyop, but the term global South, like emerging markets. <laughs> and, uh, but this idea of that, it's like Bitcoin should be for everybody, but it's also why we focus like in this part of the market, at least specifically, I'll speak for myself. It's because the reality is like we, and I forget where we were talking about it. It may have been the last pod, yeah, with Brian, that we haven't figured out like this silver bullet or this way to explain everything we're talking about here and how you wrap it up into like why Bitcoin is an asset that an institution should plug a billion dollars into or uh, 10 billion or whatever the percentage is and why they need it. And that's where like we're focused on there is because it's seeing that. And, and that's also why I don't like it, but it just is what it is. Like this ETF is that signal to the market that like you go there and then everybody benef benefits from it. The whole all 8 billion or whatever number of people on the planet. Yeah. yeah. And I'll take the middle of the road answer, which I think it's going to happen from both ends at the same time. Because going back to what we said earlier, like going back to the example of Cody, basically launching that product and opening up that AI market um, to people who, previously didn't have access to it that's going to continue happening and 
that's and again that's a really exciting part like i think the ux around bitcoin products particularly over the lightning network has improved significantly over the last couple of years and um there's going to be use cases that people really want to leverage that will only be possible if you have bitcoin and are able to pay for it um but the the example but, sorry just that is like if the money increases then the awareness goes so 10x the number of people build the utility but if like the utility increases but the price doesn't then they don't actually use it because the utility is there but you still need like the value to be flowing through the system agree that's why i think i think it happening from both ends at the same time like is is jet fuel for it and, and to clarify i mean i i totally hear what you're saying on like i, I hear both of what you're saying bottoms up adoption is probably going to be pretty fast but like you need the real capital to come in to to, to make the transition complete and probably to spark it. But I, I guess my, my bigger question is specifically, and this is what I'm still running into and seeing more and more is a lot of these, at least US companies being like, we love the instant payment network, at least at this stage in our life, like we don't want to put in the extra time and hassle to figure out how to deal with the compliance of accepting Bitcoin payments, not a core business. How do we get this into dollars? And I'm curious if you guys think that like some easy access in and out of dollars is, is the critical next step. Yeah. I think we more need more strike like APIs where somebody wants to pay a Bitcoin invoice, they can pay dollars from their account directly and then vice versa. If somebody um, wants to cater to customers who want to pay in Bitcoin, but they want to take on that, that risk of holding it on their balance sheet and immediately convert it to dollars. That'll be, that'll be big. And then it'll be interesting to see like if that, that worry is driven more by the exposure to Bitcoin directly or, um, and the volatility or just the regulatory risk about around interacting with it at all. Um, if it's the former, it'll be interesting to see like st if stable coins on Taro find product market kit uh, fit, excuse me, or something like stable sats, uh, stability pools within Fetty Mints are able to, to fulfill that need. Uh, I do um, see it. And obviously historically has been a big problem. It's going to be a problem for a bit, but I would just say, like, again, everything we've been discussing here, like, it's their loss. It's going to happen eventually. You're going to adopt Bitcoin in some form or another. It's just a matter of when you do that. And that's where you throw it back on them. And like, hey, do you want to be an innovator? Do you actually want to, like, move the world forward? Like, are you going to move first or, or wait because you're worried about what the government's going to say? We need more maverick builders out there just say, fuck it. And I, I, I do believe it's a bit contrarian. And people don't like when I say it, but I think if we build fast enough and make it so useful uh, in a timely manner and just people begin using it, like the regulatory and compliance stuff will figure itself out in the end. You're literally like, I think about it with podcasting 2.0, like people are streaming me eight sats a minute, every minute of every day, like the very between eight and a hundred sats every minute, like the accounting, like the, I'm just gonna, at the end of the day, I'll do like a monthly aggregate of the sats that have been streamed to my node and then like pick the highest price of the month and then pay uh, income tax on that. But I think eventually at scale, it's going to be so in all encompassing that it's going to be impossible for, for compliance to catch up and you're just figured out on the back end. And to any of the builders out there a bit apprehensive, like I would just, say stop being a pussy and you know with the plan like and it's happening you can get in now or get it later yeah uh, uh, and i guess i have to weigh in too since since we we had two opinions there of, and i i'm pretty much towards the the michael camp of uh you know i, th I think these are kind of independent things that are going in parallel um and for example like if there was no having and if you also said, all right, uh, first world people, the, nobody else will be allowed to buy any more Bitcoin or, or adopt any more um, be, beyond what's, uh, you know, um, mined every day so that you can have the price go sideways. Um, so then you, you sort of like freeze Bitcoin in terms of its value um, as digital gold. But then, then the utility would start to catch up like, and, and that's like a slow exponential curve. I think I like it very early in an exponential curve such that, um, you know, the 6 billion people in the world that are cut off from banking or, or really, I guess it's probably 3 billion, but the, the 6 billion you referred to earlier of, uh, 
you know, who aren't really plugged into the internet as we know it, um, can become plugged into the internet as we know it and can be productive and grow the value of Bitcoin because of their productivity using Bitcoin as their um, unit of account there. Uh, and, and then that productivity would turn into the, the growth of Bitcoin, Bitcoin's value, even if, you know, the West wasn't um, plowing money into it. Um, but that, that would take a long time, I think, it, or it, that's a decade plus to really see a measurable effect, I think. Um, but luckily we have the halving <laughs> uh, and we have, and we have the uh, fiat currencies be eroding every year uh, and, and 30, $300 billion, uh, $300 trillion in bonds that are going to just be lit on fire over the next decade as we have to print more money to pay down the sovereign debt, um, such that Bitcoin becomes the best asset, the, the fastest horse for this decade. And, and I think that is the 99%, or maybe it's 95% of where the, the value will be coming from um, for Bitcoin holders this decade. And then I think all of the, the long tail, all of the growth will be coming long term from the GDP growth that comes from this sort of system. But it, first, it's about onboarding all of the world's capital or as much of it as, as wants to be in a good store value asset. I think it's going to happen much quicker. I think uh, I recorded with Matthew Mazinxius yesterday to go over the uh, Q2 2023 monetary base update. And he had just a stunning set, which is like the compound annual growth rate of the global money supply, physical cash over the last 50 years is 13% in rising. And so that's like a having a doubling of the physical amount of cash in the world every 5.7 years. So five and a half oh, wow. years. About. Yeah, um, wow. And so that, that number is only rising. <laughs> and it can, when you consider the state of the banking sector here in the U.S. and the debt situation that everybody's facing globally, it's hard not to imagine that that's going to continue. And when you like say that, like the, the money supply is going to double by 2028, um, potentially even sooner if they turn the money printer on more aggressively when the Fed needs to step in next time. Like, I don't think people understand how quickly this is happening. I was just gonna say people don't even use cash anymore. That what was the stat I shared this morning? It's like not one true in though. It's not true though. If you like, no, no. I was talking about Target with Target earnings. That like one out of every twenty dollars this past earnings was like out of just like being shoplifted, like people just stealing from stores. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm 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 pretty bullish, especially after this conversation. Um, <laughs> happy to happy to help stoke the fire. Well, thank you, Max. Um, it's getting dark here. The sun's about to fall. Where I'm at, obviously, I'm on the back deck. Uh, last back deck episode of the season here. I'll be back in Austin next week. But before we wrap up here, any closing thoughts? Um, turn it to Michael and Jesse first, and then we can end it with Max. I'm no, just I mean, excited. This, yeah, this is a head spinning conversation that that you know put me into my own head quite a bit. So. Uh, you know, might be the kind of thing that I have to listen back to again to 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 think through all this stuff more. Um, so thanks to Max for bringing a, a ton of information um, and excitement and and a, a lens that I think you know I'm a digital gold guy. Um, I think that's what's so exciting about Bitcoin and and I, I think that's exciting enough for my lifetime. You know, um, so I don't even spend much time thinking about all of this other utility stuff and and, and Max points out that this is uh, this is this is Promethean fire really that you know Bitcoin has granted this gift to the, to the world to the world of machines really the the world the digital age as we know it um, and what we can build with that is going to be incredible to watch unfold over the next few decades yeah you can't can't say it better than Jesse but uh, to echo those sentiments and then um, Max, if you, you know, w this was one of the first going into the AI topic, but would love, you know, in the back with us, uh, letting us, let us know other folks that are deep in this space as we think about other uh, guests to have on. 
And then just feel very fortunate, like all the stuff we've been thinking about, talking about behind the scenes and to get to be able to discuss it in a forum where other individuals can start to pull on these threads. It was rewarding to see Jesse kind of noodling on some of the thoughts uh, you shared, Max, and thinking through it. And so I think that this will be a good kind of um, entry point for folks when they've been hearing about Noster or how AI plays in and Bitcoin and AI are interoperable uh, as a good entry point to that. And then ideally we can continue to, to pull on the different angles. Totally. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you guys for having me. This was a lot of fun. Um, I mean, I also very much appreciate hearing your takes on some of the macro stuff and, and look, I still think capital going into Bitcoin, like that's huge. Right? Like the good news is like you said, all of this is happening in parallel. And so, you know, it's, I, it's really all the protocol. Huh? It, I love, I, I, a lot of the, for a lot of this conversation, I kept thinking about how you're talking about fat protocols, that, that concept from Union Square Ventures that was yeah. really about Ethereum, but is really about Bitcoin at the end of the day. Exactly. Uh, yes. Um, and, and that this is, this is why just holding a slice of, of the Bitcoin supply is such an incredible asymmetric difference from the internet revolution because you couldn't hold a slice of the internet. And here you can just hold the, the underlying asset and get to participate in the growth of all of this utility that happens on top of it. Totally, I couldn't say it better. In fact, you know, I even though I've only formally been in VC for the last, you know, whatever, it was two years of my fund and two years before that, I followed all of this landscape very closely for a long time. And in the early 2010s, I actually followed USB very closely. And, you know, I'm still friends with a lot of those guys there. My last fund, we co-invested with them a lot. Um, and I kind of think in many ways, like my fun thesis is I'm just kind of looking back and using the USB playbook again, but this time with Bitcoin, Lightning, and Oster. And so Love I think it. they call a lot of things right back in the 2010s. And I think they got a little distracted with some of the Ethereum stuff, although they are, are all of them are on Noster, at least looking at it pretty closely, which is cool. Oh, cool. Uh, but um, but yeah, like literally all the stuff they were investing in, I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of uh, cribbing their their play sheet a little bit. So, but but yeah, but thank you guys. I mean, this was a lot of fun. Um, the last two things I would just mention, if people want to learn more about this stuff, you know, and Jesse, you, you mentioned you want to go back and actually listen to some of this stuff again on my website, hivemind.bc. I have all my writings on there, so I've I've gone in pretty great detail about a lot of these topics. Um, and I'm always open. You can also find me on Noster, obviously. Uh, go to Noster.band and just type in Max or Primal and type in Max, Primal.net, I believe. Um, and the other thing I would just say is for people that are really interested in the AI stuff specifically, one cool project I meant to mention earlier, but I'm, I'm really excited about, this is actually my last, uh, I guess, announced investment, is GPUtopia. <laughs> that, that's the brand they're going to, to market with. Um, they literally just announced this yesterday. But next week, um, you, if you download Albi and you have, uh, you know, their Lightning wallet, you can rent out any spare GPU capacity that you have. Now, this is going to be, I think people are going to be pretty wowed by what all this looks like, because right now, as I mentioned, the reason NVIDIA just went to the moon is there are, there are just not enough GPUs in the world, full stop. And so, and not to mention, some people want GPU access for inference that maybe they want uncensored inference or whatever, not, you know, fine-tuned by OpenAI. And so this is one of the short-term ideas I would encourage everyone to check out and just play with, because I think it's going to blow a lot of people's minds. You know, as you look at the number of GPUs that were produced by NVIDIA, I forget the exact numbers, but it's some multiple of that is all of the uh, new M chips that Apple has put out in their iPads, their MacBooks, and their iPhones. And so the concept here is in the future, the way the Apple M chips work is they can basically, they're going to be much better for machine learning than people realize for some of this inference stuff. Is like, imagine a world where you can just click a button and say, make money and just rent out your GPU or your Apple M2 or whatever you have when you're not using it and just start earning sats for free. Um, I think this is going to be a really big idea. And if, y'all, if anyone's interested in the AI stuff, like this is the one to watch over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, if you drop it, uh, send us the email on the thread we're in. We can drop it in the show notes along with your mm-hmm. blog. Yeah. Exciting times, gentlemen. Max, thank you for joining us. I'm pretty bullish. Guess we'll end with that. Guys. A lot of fun. We'll see everybody next week. See ya.